This is Tokioki. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's just about talking to this microphone about whatever you want to talk about. It's kind of up to you. Uh, my name is Mikey. I'm going to be kicking this off, but we hopefully are going to have a couple of other people going in the middle of the table tonight as this evening wears on. Um, but uh, we don't know what people are going to talk about. We're here at Mozfest. Um, and uh, who knows what kind of conversation that's going to bring. Uh, we don't know. Uh, I'm gonna, my name's Mikey, as I said. What's your name? Hi, I'm Margot. And I'm Isham. Isham. Yeah, that's my name indeed. Okay, we're going to hit you with a round of applause. Okay, the, those who know Tokioki know that... Hang on. <laughs> that um, the way it starts is I just say, what do, what do people want to talk about? I want to find out what this is, because you were clicking your fingers. What does that mean? Mm. Um, I, from what I know... Uh, it's uh, mainly a form of, uh, of uh, manifesting uh, approval of, or enjoyment mm. uh, without interfering uh, noisily with what's happening. For example, like uh, queer shows or uh, I feel I feel like it, com it comes from queer communities mainly right. to to manage to let people do their thing or continue their performance. So but but you 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 signal. It's a bit less disruptive than exactly. I, it, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's exactly yeah. that. Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a bit loud. Yeah, yeah. And I, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> okay, so it's a, uh, okay, so it's a, because I, I remember somebody was telling me that in opera houses, they, uh, for instance, they do not that, but they do, or well, they go like this in a table. So it's strange, like because, well, or like uh, if, say, if there's a table, if there's I'm a surface. I'm a little bit disappointed with the sound of this table because it should be a bit more solid. We, more we hefty. Sent it back to Hungary to solidify it, to get it more. So it is more solid than it was. But still. welcome to uh, yeah. concert of wishes and complaints. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, anyway. but yeah. Should, should um, um, just a suggestion. Mm. Uh, maybe when people start entering, co can. Uh, but <laughs> Okay? Yeah, okay. Hello, people online. <laughs> <laughs> Streaming live on Twitch. Uh, no, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but like we uh, would we uh, like relaunch uh, uh, an opening at some point when people come in, to, just to have the, the the music is nice. I like the opening. It's it's chill. Mm. It's uh, mm. it's fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we will do that. We'll just play it by ear. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Right now, we're just getting the conversation going, so you know, so, you, you, so people don't come in cold. So, like, I of course, yeah. I guess they don't have tables in opera houses usually. Do they have no. tables or maybe? No, but you know what I'm in, thinking. In the boxes, yeah, the, I'm, I'm thinking uh, in the boxes the, when the, they are in the yeah. posh seats and in that kind of stuff. Seats, yeah. But you know, but uh, when I was when I was young, back in the day, and I was a child, and we used to go to church. <laughs> Uh, um, there was there was definitely a thing where yeah. when you're sitting on the bench, you weren't allowed to swing your feet. Uh, I mean, maybe when you're a child, it's, yeah. it's easier to swing your feet. Like in fact, you can't help mm. but swing your feet, mm. your legs. And my mum would always say, like, don't swing your legs because what? the Satan swings on your legs. You know, mm. like as if Satan sits on your feet and. Uh, so just saying. But I mean, do you, do you ever give like the priest a round of applause in the church? Not in a Catholic church that I went no. to, but maybe in a. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I've never been one to never to been mass. No, no, no. But well, no. I I grew up in Morocco, so no. no. So what religion is in Morocco? Well, don't you know? <laughs> Are you asking like uh, the, you know you know it's Islam. Okay, okay. It yeah, was a rhetorical know. question. I was wondering. We don't she a, doesn't we don't know? have a sound effect for Islam. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe you could give us a spot with the Islamic sound effect, please. <laughs> wow, well, fuck. Uh, maybe a Muslim calling for the prayer. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that yeah, would yeah, be yeah, the. Uh, yeah, but, but the thing is, it's yeah. very, very religiously yeah. char uh, charged, and I feel mm. like. Uh, mm. Europe, Western people would be upset because uh, it starts with Allah Akbar, and mm. so I think yeah. they might be like because <laughs> they're mm. Islamophobes. <coughs> it might be good to have because we do have a lot of Muslim mm. people on the table. Hello, come and join us. Help us test out this microphone. Yeah, we've got Isham, we've got Margot, and I'm Mikey. Tell us your name. Hi, I'm Floor. Uh, Floor. <laughs> Hi. Hi. 
Uh, and what are you doing here today? I'm working here. Yeah, what's your job? Um, usually just bar, and now I'm just doing kind of everything. Yeah, just You're keep everything. everything. <laughs> what, what are the others doing? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Do no, I'm just yeah. doing all the small things in between. So. Yeah, you're just like, you're like the fixer. Um, well, a little bit, you could say that. <laughs> okay, so, um, come and sit down if you want, if you want to rest your feet for two minutes, but you might be, you may well not. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I've got a question. No, because before you before you came up, I was trying to read your mm. T-shirt, and I thought it says sacrifice, and I was, and I wanted to say like, oh, isn't that amazing? We were just talking about religious sound, yeah. and now you're coming with a sacrifice. I thought, oh, that's like quite Catholic, because yeah. like, I'm Catholic. And then and I actually yeah. read the letters in Scarface, so completely different. So just wanted to say yeah, that. Okay. Are you are you a fan of the film Scarface? Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't wear the shirt. <laughs> what, what is it about Scarface that you like? Um, well, I like movies in general. It's yeah. my studies as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Al Pacino is just... Yeah. It's, he's an icon, so... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, are you wanting to become a filmmaker yourself? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Would you make Scarface too? Well, what in Scarface 2? Yeah, what would a I don't think I would remake? make a Scarface 2. Yeah, or a Just prequel. Leave it as it is. Yeah. Don't, don't do it. Hang on a sec. Let me get the microphone because otherwise we can't hear you. I, I, sorry, I, I, as I told you before, I have a very low inhibition on when I want to speak. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> like, if you had to do uh, a, a film that was as a uh, like Scarface, but in 2024, what would you put in it? Maybe some hints, would like some, same what would it have? Come and join us, yes. Hello? Hello? Yes, you can, yes. Um, we have got, uh, we've got Flo, we've got Isham, we've got Margot and Mikey, tell us your name. Steph. Steph, let me give you a, I felt that I needed that. We're just talking about what would a remake of Scarface be in 2024? Uh, not a remake, a reinterpretation. Right? A modern Scarface, that, yeah. not the same story, but the landmark, the cultural landmark it would be. What, we, what would it be? Okay, yeah. all right. Um, and we, so we've got <laughs> Steph. Come and join us. I'm, I'm, I'm strictly an observer. Okay, come and observe around the table. Um, if, we can, if we can get your name, is that okay? Jess. Jess, okay, I'll hit you with a round of applause. And Todd. Todd and I'm Mikey. Uh, we're talking about, just because of the t-shirt really, we're trying to kick this off. We've got to talk about something. We're talking about Scarface. What would a 2024 Scarface be? Would it be the same drugs? Would it be the same actors? Would it be about the drugs? same type of scars. I mean, yeah. is the actual scar on the face there? Is there like a... I don't a, even remember if because, Al Pacino's because, no, 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 because I don't, yeah. they all blend yeah. into one for me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, where's the scar? I can Where? <laughs> That's not a scar, that's just, <laughs> that's just him being old. Oh, oh, talk to us This now. was like, old, he was old then. I old. don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, so I thought you were just observing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, so would it be a different scar? Would it be like a stretch mark or something like that? <laughs> rather than, a, and would it be scar face? Would it be I'm scar something? Scar else? Yeah. Well, I'm think about it and go yeah. back to work, but I'll come back. Okay, yeah. okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so where are we going to go with this conversation? Yep. I mean, I was just the mm. other day watching an old, like when I say old, it's not really that old. Uh, yeah. It was like early 2000s. It was some kind of like a thriller. Mm. No, 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 but get this right. Mm. I think, no, 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 but what I mean is like it, it came yeah. across really dated and I'm like, man, that's only like 20 something years ago. It's what like, was the name of the film? I don't remember. Because uh, <laughs> uh, obviously these days my attention span was, is just was it not speed as... speed with Keanu Reeves? No, no it was, wasn't. No. no, it was something yeah. my friend called it. Centrabulok, <laughs> because he said it with French accent. So yeah. Centrabulok, and the way she was acting as well, her character, yeah. she was like playing like really kind of like almost masculine police uh, person, and she was like, "Hey, you, m my deputy, whatever, get into my bed now!" Like almost like demonstratively, uh, like yeah. you know, masculine. And I thought. There's kind of lack of subtlety, but maybe that's how films were back then. Maybe mm. you had to be like that this. Films got more so subtle. Felt pretty, I don't know about subtle, but yeah. like, do you remember the movies from the eighties? Yeah. Where every single movie, I, it doesn't matter which one, it seems like you had a boob shot. Yeah. I, 
Seriously. Yeah. I mean, it was like it wasn't an 80s movie unless someone was taking their top off. Right, okay. Uh, with this kind of like... Oh, sorry, not that one. With, uh, with, uh, hang on, this is a different keypad to the one. Not that one. Not this one. Not, okay, yeah. With this... Yeah, this kind of music, and it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, normally as well, some kind of saxophone or so, so or things. But I, I recently saw uh, Harry when Harry meets Sally, which uh, yeah. it does have a boob, boob shot, but it's fucking genius. Yeah, it's you're, genius. You're like, it's yeah. so modern. I saw it, and it's yeah. local. I was like, these, this, these people in the '80s understood mm. uh, gender dynamics uh, to a point uh, well there's a lot of talk about marriage and, mm. and uh, fuck that shit sorry mm. <laughs> uh, but but otherwise it's really uh, so modern in the way uh, like the the, the the characters are portrayed uh, even if and if even if it's a comedy okay, it's pretty so pretty has everybody here seen when harry met sally todd you haven't seen that no, no you've not seen it yeah so I'm always careful to coach this by saying, because I've got an American accent, so I always yeah. carefully say, it's not a weird religious thing, but I grew up without TV and movies yeah. and only started watching stuff in about 2008. Right. So I tend to watch stuff in batches. Yeah. So like horror movies, yes. Yeah. Uh, Korean revenge films, yeah. yeah. Um, haven't got around to romantic comedies yet, but apparently Harry uh, Met yeah, okay. Sally. Yeah. Yeah, okay. tell, tell us about when Harry Met Sally. Oh my gosh, so I don't mm. want to spoil it but it's, it's mm. basically it really is it's yeah. about relationships it's yeah, about no, together in the end, wow, well no no see that you totally spoiled it because the whole movie yeah. is about whether men and women can just be friends yeah so they were they were clearly wasn't it was it? Yeah. okay well somebody look it up on wikipedia <laughs> when was it let's call it 80 90 ish yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um but it it does bring up a, a kind of yeah, go on. I quite like the mm. systematic way of watching films. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen any 80s films? Which, I, come and I join am. us. I am, I'm just curious. From, yes, we're talking about films from the 80s. What's your, What's your favorite, favorite 80s, 80s film? film? And does it have a... Yeah. <laughs> come on, join us, join us. We, we have got Isham, we have got Jess, we've got Steph, we've got Todd, we've got Margot and Mikey. Tell us your name. And you come, uh, as an yeah. opt-out button. Anyway, go on. But what I wanted, what I yeah. wanted to say is, like my friend, for instance, it's interesting that you watch mm. things in batches because my friend has got this thing mm. which is brilliant and a curse at the same time because you can never <laughs> get him a book because he's like, no, 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 I'm just catching up with uh, the classics. So at the moment he's on like 1700 books, you so know, he's like reading bo books. From yeah, like yeah. From like the Bible onwards. Yeah, it was ca kind of. I don't know if you read a Bible. I'd yeah. expect so. Yeah. And you know, and you want yeah. to buy him a book or something. He's like, oh, have you have you read this? I remember like re reading something by Michel Houellebecq. He's like, no, 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 that's just too modern. Don't talk to me about this. I'm still on so some 1600s or when whatever. When is he gonna read the? Well, this is a question. Book. Is he ever gonna catch up with okay. today? I don't know. And yeah. That's interesting because yeah. I mm. used to. Um, sorry. Um, the mic. Yeah. I got that mic. Yes. I, if you ran. <laughs> I used to resist watching movies that were based off books because it's like, no, I want to read the book yeah. first because the yeah. book is always better than the movie. Yeah. But then it got to a point where I just didn't have time to read the books. So it's always missing out on all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, am I at this this yeah. crossroad, this junction where I have to decide, all right, am I going to continue doing that or am I actually just going to make it? the leap? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Wait for the microphone. <laughs> Wait for the microphone because I want to bring Todd in on this. Have you seen any? Um, have you? Are, are you one of these people that doesn't read the book or wants to read the book? Are you? Uh, I basically never read the book. You never read the book. Okay, <laughs> never ever. Yeah. You just watch the movie. Just watch the movies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and do you think you're missing something from not reading the book? No, I don't think so. Yeah. All right, okay. So you say yeah. that, but yeah. question: <laughs> Did you read the Harry Potter books? No. Oh! Okay, <laughs> Harry, who? Are, are you familiar with the Harry Potter franchise? I'm familiar with it because uh, no. I, I, I'm familiar with it. I do not have any products of that fran franchise. I've never read any of Harry Potter books, never watched a film, but the same goes for Star Wars. But that's not what I wanted to say. That's not that's not my main thing. Yeah. My main thing is Casablanca as a film. I learned that it used to be a play. It started off as a play, which yeah. is a bit more, um, I think in the play, it's the woman, the main character, she doesn't sleep with Rick, who is played right. by H Humphrey Bogart. But then in the film, 
the scene is deliberately ambiguous. So it looks like it, she could, but maybe she, she didn't. She so I quite have, like yeah. that. You can do that okay. when you do film. All right, okay. Of all the talk shows in the world, you had to walk into mine. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, okay, yeah. Todd, were you going to say something? You're leaning forward a little bit as if you're going to say something. No. So, okay, so... I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, like, for example, a, 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 a film that's not very known to be adapted from a book is Starship Trooper. Yeah. It's adapted from a book. Uh, and yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, apparently the guy who wrote the book, the yeah. book uh, basically was a f straight up fascist. What? And he was, uh, his book was completely pro-military, very like, re yeah. for, it was, uh, it was a m politically a mess. And then, uh, so like, like a militarist. Yeah. And so the guy, I forgot his name again, the whole, uh, the, the Dutch guy who, who, who did the movie. The Dutch guy who did the movie. <laughs> like uh, the, the, about the the the, re the, the director of Starship Trooper is Dutch. Oh, I how is it? How is he called again? Shit. Uh, uh, like, but like he uh, purposefully appended the the narrative so that it was yeah. ironic and uh, denun denunciation of fascism. I was right. losing my mind thinking that this was a novel that had originally been written in Dutch. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay, cool. Yeah. I I could not deal with that many levels of what. <laughs> okay, mind blowing. Okay, so do, I mean, do we then just forget about books, forget about the literature and just stick with the films, it's faster, it's more, it's less, less problematic politics, potentially, when we, yeah, go on. I just find this interesting, mm. like, you know, there's a story and there's the author of a story and is there like some kind of, yeah. should you keep that separate? Because for instance, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the film, The um, Children of Men? Children of Men. Yeah, right. It's, from a it's like a, it's it's fr it's from a novel, but that novel it's basically the book is about. Uh, sorry, so the, the film is about a society not unlike the one we live in now, where people just stop. Uh, they lose the ability to uh, uh, procreate or like have children, reproduce. So then it's like this whole craze. I can't remember how it ends actually, but it's a really great oh film. I want to rewatch it. Right? Yeah. Okay. Mm, then, yeah. But but what I found amazing is the person who wrote it is a really kind of diehard Tory conservative. Politician. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Okay, so Tory. By the way, Pete, I don't know because we're not oh, not wait. every. We're not even in the UK, so be, oh, sorry, the people even know what a Tory politician is. Uh, so yeah, yeah. When I first moved to the UK, I was confused because you mm. would say sometimes say, oh wow the Tories or the Conservatives, and I was like, oh, they're the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then when I first got here, I was like, oh, and the Lib Dems are the same thing. Yeah. And then it took me a while, and, yeah. and I was like, no, that's not true. And then I was like, oh, that's true. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Come, yes, it, come and join us, yes. It's weird, but yes. optional. We, we have got Margot, we have got Isham, we have got Jess. we a got guest. Christopher. Christopher. We have got Steph, we've got Todd and Mikey at the moment. We're talking about um, we're talking about films, really, and we're talking about the film Children of Men. Have you seen it? Um, apparently it's written by a Tory. Do you know what a Tory is? No. No, okay. Jess, you were just explaining. What is a Tory? Oh, like British Conservatives. They, it's not cute. Although that, that one yeah. guy keeps getting, like, we don't see. What's the uh, passive for yeeted? Um, people keep like throwing stuff at Nigel Farage, which is right, quite all yeah. right. Uh, no, yeah. no, today he got like pelted. Okay. The battle bus, he got battled. Okay, so Nigel Farage is getting stuff thrown at him again. Um, I don't know, is anyone following the UK politics? Where are people from? Let me maybe we just do oh, a quick. There we go. Yeah. Go. Uh, I'm from Seattle in the United uh, States. Okay. Do you follow the UK politics? I do because half my team is right. from the UK, but. Only tangentially. I mean, heck, I, to be clear, mm. I find it very hard to read the news in my own country. So yeah. I just yeah. follow top oh, level. So it's a kind of light relief to read about the Tories. <laughs> it is light relief to, to read yeah. about what's happening to other people rather yeah. than my own. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go around the table on this one. Are you following what's happening in UK politics? Where are you from? Yes, I'm from Edinburgh. Edinburgh, okay. Yeah, that's what we're going to, yeah. yeah. Um, any views on it? On the UK politics, yeah. Um, In a nutshell, I would say this election I should be excited about, but I'm very sad because right. the Tories are going to get kicked out, mm. but Labour are very uh, off, off yeah. a very poor. Yeah. <laughs> so you're unexcited, let's say, unexcited about political change going. Okay, 
Chris, where are you from? Athens, Greece. Yeah, okay. We have our own uh, drama in politics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you know about what? Do you, do you follow what's happening in the UK or in the US? We were consumed with news about the Euro elections. Okay. And how did that go? We want uh, to take a break. Yeah. Okay. So you actually want a bit of a break? I mean, this is kind of what you're saying as well. Do we need a bit of a break from politics? Do we need because it's just too much? To time. Yeah. From time to time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Where are you from, Jess? I'm from the States, but from I live in Birmingham, which is the finest Birmingham. city in Europe. Yeah. All right. It's very, very ugly, and unfortunately, it's in England, but yeah. best city. Okay. <laughs> Apart from being ugly and then being in England, it's a cool place. Okay. All right. What's good about Birmingham? Can you tell us? More miles of canal than Venice. We've got oh, wait, yeah. oldest working cinema in the UK. Yeah. Uh, fantastic brutalist architecture. Birthplace of metal. Right. Um, great experimental music scene. Fantastic food. First super diverse city in the UK. Um, I can keep going. It's just it's a monologue. Yeah. It's not yeah. good. Um, yeah. Can you accent. can you do a, yeah? Oh, can no, you do a Birmingham accent? I can't. It sounds like I'm making fun if I do it. Anyone got any ideas how to do a Birmingham accent? You're wrong, mate. That's Boston. That's, I learned that from a friend. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so we've got, so we've got United States, Birmingham. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Rabat in Morocco, but I, yeah. I live in, Bel in Brussels. Okay. Okay. And uh, do you anything to say about any politics at all? Or do you want to just... Do we want to... I just want to say, people may not know this. This is Tokyoki. This is your talk show. We are... The people speak, and we're called the people speak because it's up to you to decide what you want to talk about. I'm just getting a flow going. So if we want to talk about politics, we talk about politics. But if we don't, we talk about something else. Anyway, do anything you want to say about politics? Uh, it's pretty fucking bleak right now, yeah. in Europe especially. Yeah. Why? In France particularly, especially. Yeah. You, you really want to go there? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, they have 40 percent, more than 40 percent of. Uh, yeah. uh, Far right leaning uh, parties yeah. winning the the election what in is European. Going on? Why? Why and is that happening? I think like they had. Uh, I, it's in my opinion. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. I'm not a politician. I'm uh, really far from that. Yeah. But like, I feel like uh, people try different uh, l politics mm. leaning the last these last 15 or 20 years. And uh, got consistently disappointed because yeah. when you have uh, when we had uh, when we uh, mean uh, Belgian and, and French are, France are very close by so it's usually yeah. uh, close by but like uh, when they had the left leaning government they yeah. were the one who enacted uh, social uh, um, economic austerity b policies which doesn't sound very left leaning mm -hmm. when it's right people they they float with the right they fuck up social services yeah. that's like, uh, it's like uh, so. Uh, it's I think a bit it's like what Todd was saying. Th it's kind of yeah. they tried everybody yet, yeah. and uh, but they haven't tried the extreme uh, far right yet. Okay. The problem right. problem yeah. is that like, when far right yeah. is going to come, they're going to bust shit out, oh. and then there won't be much left. Hang on, hang on. Oh, you just, can you give us a final. Are you coming back? Oh, uh, possibly. I need. Give to us a final. Give us a final thought for now. Inter intermediate final thought. Oh. Uh, yeah. Anybody who really, really likes beautiful, beautiful cities should not visit. But people who like absolutely off the chain weird stuff please come to Birmingham okay come to Birmingham okay we're kind of at a crossroads here do we go on do we actually go head first into the the kind of dystopian nightmare that is our current day present politics or do we want to talk about something else it's kind of up to you the choice is yours the choice is yours it's up to you all of you around the table what are the themes that energize us? If yeah. politics uh, yeah. depress us, what are the topics that what energizes uh, us? Okay, yeah. I'm going to do. We've got a technique because you're learning how to do talkyoki. This yeah, is important. Is Chris has asked this question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what's called the turn the mirror technique. Because mm. well, yeah. yeah, because you've asked what are the topics that energize us. I'm going to ask you what energizes you, Chris, and then we're going to go around the table and ask everyone else as well. Volunteering. Volunteering? Yeah. For? Community. For, for community? Yeah. In Athens or around the world or a global community? In Athens, at the local level. Yeah. Uh, wherever is, uh, mm. you know, near my neighborhood, near right. people. Yeah. Uh, whether for climate mm. or for uh, integration, social inclusion, yeah. such yeah. kind of stuff. Okay. Then I'm going to hit you with a round of applause for that because it does sound. 
much more worthy than what I do. I'm going around the table, I'm going to ask everyone, Chris asked the question, what energises you? So we've got volunteering, doing stuff on a local level, maybe about global things like climate. But Ishan, what energises you? Well, uh, way too, uh, honestly, yeah. mini paint, miniature painting. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, doesn't sound very energetic because I'm. Yeah. Uh, you sit at a, a desk and you paint small, uh, small plastic figures uh, yeah. with uh, very tiny brushes right. for hours. Like, uh, yeah. Have yeah. you got any favorite figures? Wow, uh, I don't want to cite them because they are, have already too much economical power, so I don't want to cite them. Right, like, okay, so economically powerful miniature figures. Yeah, economically powerful company owning figures, so I don't okay, want to so get, they don't need more more uh, right. clout than they okay. already have. All right, okay. Yeah. But, like, yeah. but it's great though to paint yeah. them. What energizes you? I think talking to people energizes me, but I, I'm just yeah. interested in what you said about volunteering, just because is volunteering like a really kind of counter capitalist action, or is it l like leaning into being exploited by capitalism? I'm just yeah. curious. <laughs> are, you, are you escaping the system or just being uh, a sucker to the system? That's the, that's the question. Okay, we're going to hot part that because I did promise. I did promise we'd go around. What energizes you, Todd? Uh, cycling. Getting cycling, out, getting yeah. out on my bike. What kind of bike have you got? Uh, right, a standard bike. Yeah. You know, two wheels, handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Will you cycle here? Did you cycle here? I've already already got a bike. Yeah. Hired a bike. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So you hired a bike here. You yeah, didn't yeah, take yeah. your bike. You didn't cycle from Edinburgh. No, I did not cycle from Edinburgh. Yeah. No. Yeah. Although you could do it. You could take, you could yeah. take it on the train, yeah. on the Eurostar, bring mm. it with you. Nice. Okay, so second. come join us. What energizes you? That's what we're asking at the moment. Uh, are you, are, are you, are we not, we're not interfering on your mic levels, are you, or anything like that? But I hope not. No. Okay, okay, you're just looking for beer. Okay. That's just beer energizes them. We, beer energizes them. Okay, right. Steph, what energizes you? I am a. Inner, I am a hermit. That's just yeah. it. So it energize, mm. what energizes me is honestly being away from people and being yeah. in nature, listening to the birds, yeah. being with my dog. I've got a sound effect for that. <laughs> oh, no, not that. that does not I'm sound energizing. That. That's just, this is because I've swapped keypads from one I was using uh, on Saturday, and it it's got all the maybe it's this one. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah, there we are. I like yeah. that much. Yeah, yeah, I have my husband built a hammock in the backyard. Yeah. I spend yeah. my free time there. That's yeah. that's my jam. Yeah, it is. Yeah, beautiful. It's really okay, so different things energize different. But where do we want to go? Do we want to talk about volunteering? Do we want to cycling? Volunteer cycling in nature? Do we want to sort of, kind of painting miniature figures on the way? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think I'm allergic to something here. I don't know what that is, but. Um, uh, <laughs> Maybe not. No, I hope I don't you're think. not allergic to bullshit. Because no, you're no. Wrong, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> in the wrong job. No, but yeah. I'm. I'm just wondering for somebody who loves nature. You know, when you go into cities mm. and they they kind of go mm. like, oh, you know, we planted some trees here. There's like a little green oasis. Does that yeah. even make a difference? I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, we've got this gig, haven't we, to ask the people of East London next week where they want their trees. But is that the same as going out into nature? So I. I I'm probably going to tick off a lot of people by saying this, but I absolutely abhor New York City because they have trees on the sidewalks, but it's cement. I mean, there's, there's, it's not green there. Mm. I come from <laughs> Seattle where I have mm. mountains, I have water, I have all the different elements of nature around me. And if it isn't, the whole ecosystem isn't there, then it's, no, it's not green. Yeah, it's so not, if you just plant a tree somewhere, that does nothing for me. So what, you don't, you're not interested in this? No, not particularly. Decision. Now, the garden out back, I absolutely love, because I, yeah. I can feel surrounded yeah. by nature. Yeah. That's walk... where we were supposed to be doing Tokyoki, but it, apparently it's going yeah. to storm. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, what do other people think about nature and cities? Can you combine the two? You're saying yes? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah. about Edinburgh? Is it quite a sort of nature? It's quite green. City? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of private parks from yeah. when it was developed. So yeah. it's a lot of green space, but it's not all necessarily, not necessarily all publicly public. yeah. accessible. Okay. Yeah, there's a seat, like right in the middle of town. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Volcano in the middle of town. It's a volcano. Yeah, an extinct Edinburgh. volcano. Yeah, wow. <laughs> okay. 
we're learning all the time. Okay, so what about Athens? Is it a na natural na green space? Not really. It used to be yeah. a million of years ago. Yeah. It has the coastal line, which is lovely. Yeah. Uh, but it's overpopulated. It's a definition of the tragedy of commons. Right. And as you said, uh, whatever mm. is uh, like an intervention looks unnatural. Yeah. Not natural. Okay, so uh, it doesn't really you know, work. I'm a city boy. Yeah. Um, nature, wild nature, used to frighten me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to behave. Mm. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Any, anything in particular? What, just trees or like animals or what was Wild this? animals. Wild animals. Yeah, spiders, yeah. snakes, yeah. Yeah. all kinds of stuff. Okay. The one that can slip into the sleeping bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. About nature and cities, um, when I was growing up, I, uh, I grew up in Poland because I'm from mm. Poland, um, and we it's, it's quite an urban area where I grew up, but now and then you have a hedgehog uh, just kind of like wandering through, yeah. and as a child, <laughs> we bring it to my mom going like, Mom, look, it's a hedgehog. She's like, no, oh, put it back, it's full of fleas. I'm like, no, let's save it. Anyway, yeah. but recently I read an article that somebody from the <laughs> inner city somewhere mm. in the UK uh, found what they thought was a hedgehog and they took it into a vet uh, thing, but actually it was a bubble from the from the hat. <laughs> and they couldn't tell the difference. And I'm like, oh wow. And I thought, this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so that's just like actually, going quite far. But you made the news. We've got an example of that, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So people are people that kind of. Um, what's the word? Estranged from nature, that they can't even tell the difference between a hedgehog and a bobble. Um, is this a problem? Is it just how we're going to be? And what is the Mozilla Foundation doing about it? Yeah. Look am I the yeah. only? I am. I'm the only Mozilla Foundation yeah. employee here. Uh, yeah. About. Well, mm. we, we do have sessions around climate mm. justice and planet justice mm. that, that we're actually at MozFest, so uh, there's that. Mm. Beyond that, in terms of wildlife and nature, I don't, I, I don't have a whole lot. Okay. I mean, is it something, is it an area that maybe Mozilla could expand into? And if so, how? Has anyone got any ideas? I mean, you're a city boy, Chris, but have you got any ideas? It's a symptom. It's yeah. a symptom of the problem, the, yeah. di the disconnect. Mm. What is the problem then, if it's just a symptom? How far we went, mm. uh, how mm. far we went uh, um, in modern life, yeah. uh, building our cities uh, in ways uh, that, uh, you know, are unnatural. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Entire, entire generations uh, grew mm. up uh, without uh, any knowledge uh, mm. of uh, ecosystems. Mm. Did you hear that just like within the last year or so, um, Elon Musk and Starlink brought internet to these rural indigenous Aboriginal communities that have never yeah. been aware of the world yeah. outside and now they're like all hooked on their phones, you yeah. know? And I'm just like, oh, yeah. did we really have to do that? Yep. Come and join us. Do you feel estranged from nature? That's what we're talking about now. And should we be in the other room? Are we actually, uh, what does you know what's happening in there? Have they started? They have started. They've started? Okay, well, maybe we are distracting people from the actual main event because this is very much a side event. We're being, but we, we're becoming the main we're event. Becoming, of course, we're becoming the main <laughs> event. Next time it's going to be the other way around. There's going to be people doing speeches, but the main thing will be the talkie-okie. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's get some final thoughts. Give us a final thought, Steph. Oh, uh, love nature. <laughs> get out there in the world. That's my final thought. Okay, um, are we going to pack this up, do you think? Or should we, I think if, if we are, if there is the thing going on over there, maybe we should. Um, but we will be open for business later when the talks are finished. Maybe we should even listen to the talks. But uh, give us a final thought. Uh, hire a bike when you're here. Go yeah. on a bike ride. Yeah. I wish I had my little tring tring sound effect but i don't have it on this pad i'm so sad about that okay but it's a good final thought i hit you with a round of applause instead final thought chris beware billionaires mm. uh, bringing techno shamans mm. on earth okay, <laughs> beware the billionaires we're going to end with a uh, this then beware the billionaires talk show um, if you don't know what it is it's just simply talking into this microphone about stuff 
and we get to find out who people are, what they've got to say. Come and join us. I hear you with a round of applause. Bring your friend. We need people. Well, what's the problem with the bottle? Well, okay. Okay, so I'm just going to turn everything up a little bit so people know. Come on, yes, come and join us. We're just starting. Everyone will be here. This is Tokyoki. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. Yes. Where, well, where Tokyoki is at. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of people coming. Come and join us. So, my name is Mikey. Tell us your name. Hello, I'm Margo. And I'm, I'm Hisham. Hisham. Tell us your name. Richard. Richard, come and take a seat. Yes. Come and join in. Um, <laughs> So we're just starting up the second session of Tokyoki. Um, <laughs> my name's Mikey. So we have got Isham, we've got Margot, we're Richard. Yeah, Richard. And we've got Amin. Amin? Yeah. yeah. Benoit. Benoit, yeah. Luis. Luis, yeah. Mark. Mark. Inigo. Inigo. In yeah. Indigo. Inigo. Inigo. But yeah. Inigo. And I'm Mikey. So this is Talkie It's a pop-up talk show. The great thing about Talkie Talk is it's up to you to decide what you want to talk about. <laughs> and you in the plural. <laughs> so has anyone got anything they want to kick off with? Any thoughts, comments, observations, suggestions, ideas, interjections? <laughs> I'm inter no, no, no. I'm interested in the beers. Like, what is the what? What's what are you drinking? Yeah, only here for the uh, beers. As a, as a, uh, uh, everyone seems to have a different yeah, beer, yeah, apart yeah, from yeah, you yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. You've got the same beer. Same beer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a grape beer. Yeah, yeah a great, yeah. a great base beer. Um, okay, so um, I guess every you've not got a beer in the go. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on there? Um, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm having a late flight. You can't go! You can't go! Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry to disappoint you guys. It's, yeah. it's a whiskey coca. Is, is there a little bit of. Uh, I don't want to, to advertise yes. what type of soda this is, but it's, yeah. it's a soda. Or okay. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. We, we don't have any beers, though, do we? Have we, we got have, we have water. water. Water, water. Yeah, it's, the, it's a bit the, sad. The Okay, yeah. Well, you going to say something, Richard? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. topic of conversation. What? Yeah, what is the topic of the conversation? Is it alcohol? Do we need alcohol to socialize? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Actually, uh, yes. th that's a hard topic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard topic. Putting yourself out of the group. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, do, do you all know each other? Are you all part of... I notice you've got code carbon, code carbon, yeah. Yeah. code carbon. Oh. <laughs> Come and join us. You don't have to be put. Yes, come and join us. Yes, yes, we have got. We're gonna maybe we'll do a little theme tune again. We've got Inigo. We've got Mark. We've got uh, Lewis. We've got Benoit. We have got Amin. We have got Richard. Don't make it easy for me because then I don't. There's no challenge. Uh, and who have we got over here? Tell us your name. Tom. Tom and Satish. 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 Um, were you here last year? Yeah. Yes. Okay. No. Okay. okay. I take back that round of applause then. I take back that round of applause. Okay, so this is Talkie Aki Barber Talk Show. And right now we're, we're just getting going. We're talking about alcohol. Do we need alcohol to socialize? Um, and what is it doing? Why? What is, the, what is the power of alcohol? What is it actually doing? Yeah. It is sometimes called a social lubricant, social lubricant, but there is something like too much lubricant sometimes. Yeah. So, like, a, like if a piece, like if a change. piece of of yeah. gear is already greasy enough, does it yeah. need more lubricant? Yeah. Okay. Does it? Does, does it? Does uh, the lubrication? Do we over lubricate sometimes? <laughs> Are we in danger of over lubricating? <laughs> oh no! I was just posing for a photo, but oh. yeah, may, may <laughs> <laughs> I'll grab one of these. Um, no, 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 but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a bit of social lubrication is kind of, it's necessary, but I wonder, you know, if it's not the beers, like, can you get any other type of lubrication? I don't have a beer, that's not to say, like, can somebody get me a beer, because I don't want a beer, but, you know, but I, I just think, um, you know, is there anything other than alcohol that could kind of perform that social lubrication role? Okay. Or is alcohol, like, the main thing? Does it have to be alcohol? Dance. Dance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you just think it's more awkward. Yeah. Dance is more difficult. Alcohol is still easier. You have to grab and drink. Many <laughs> to dance, you need alcohol first, okay. and then only you can dance. Dance comes after alcohol. Yeah. yeah. So. 
Okay, so <laughs> other forms of sober, social lubrication, your uh, dance suggestion has got a little bit of a... Uh, to, yeah. Board games, board games or, or games in general, like yeah. and something to bring people together on mm. something other than the fact of talking, and that yeah. it gets them to talk about something okay, else. Okay, so like, almost like... What's that? Nothing. <laughs> 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 you saying you don't drink? Me, I I don't drink. That's why within one like one glass, I'm actually feeling it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Okay. Um. Do you? So do you? Can I ask you, Sati? Do you need alcohol for social lubrication? Oh, no, I don't. I don't like socializing. You don't like socializing. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. So. Yeah. Okay. Do you not like people, or do you prefer? We had uh, in the first session. Come and join us. If you like people, if you don't like people, it doesn't matter. We've got people that don't like people here actually so you don't even need to like people to come and join this but I mean we on the first um, on the first session we had someone that said they preferred nature to people they preferred like bird songs let me get, try to remember which one it is. Do you remember all of them? Like, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you remember all of them? Well, I do, but the problem is I've got two different boards with two different sets of. Uh, uh, yeah. But um, do, do you like do you like people? Do you like people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depends. 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 What kind of what? What? Okay. Come. What kind of people do you like? Is it photogenic people that you like? Are we are we photogenic? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, come and join us as well. This is Tokyoki Pop Up Talk Show. At the moment, we are talking. We have got Sati, we have got Tom, we've got Richard, we have got Amin, we have got Benoit, we've got Louis, we have got Mark, we have got. Um, we have. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. We have got. Uh, what? Inigo, Inigo, yes. And tell us your name Soledad. Sole, Soledad. Sole, Sole. 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 Okay. And we've got Isham and we've got Margot and Mikey. I remember my name. So that's definitely. <laughs> but we're talking about do we need alcohol for social lubrication? Are there other forms of social lubrication? Do we even want to be socially lubricated? Sati says no. I've only come here. Why have you come here this today? Oh, here? Oh, actually, I was looking for peace, but then I saw you. <laughs> but then I saw you. Come to Moz Fest. Oh. Because they were freeing for free tickets. Oh, and, you okay. Know, all right. Right. <laughs> all about the, the, the f getting something for free. But <laughs> that's a good reason. Yeah. That's, that? that's a good reason to socialize, yeah. to get free tickets. It's uh, yeah. Free stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> free free food is a good socialization. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, so and um, what do you think? You've, you're one of the people without any alcohol. Do you need alcohol for social lubrication? Uh, do you depends. Like, do you like people? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm mm. I'm uh, from Uruguay, so I'm a Latin Latin American woman. I yeah, yeah very much people oriented, but uh, I also live in Finland, so I like my space. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well balanced. Yeah, <laughs> but that sweet balance. spot, the sweet spot for the social lubrication, maybe. Yeah. Okay, sweet I, spot. I can say that yeah. I don't like the word lubrication. Uh, in, yeah. in this sense, while we are drinking, it's kind of like yeah. <laughs> doesn't it make you want to drink. Or yeah. I, I don't know. Can you come up with a better word? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to like, get it out. <laughs> so, uh, somebody told me about this concept of a social momentum. I, I said that before, so people who have heard it before, sorry if I'm repeating yeah. myself. But I find that like really interesting. So it's, yes, yeah, so it's taking it from the gross place of yeah. like uh, lubrication. Where is it coming from? Is it, uh, you know? Yeah, it's, a, it's more of a flow. Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's more like a concept. I don't know. It's yeah. like concepts are, are more kind of acceptable. I think mm. I mean, we're, less I gross. That's what we're trying to do here: is get a flow going. What is going to be the big flow? What are the big subjects? Did you come for the people? Did you come for the free tickets? Uh, just what's that for the freaks? All the creative, <laughs> all the yeah. all the creative people that Matilda yeah. puts in this yeah. recipe that you never know what you're gonna get. Okay. <laughs> but it's always good. It's have always got, good. Have you got a favorite type of freak, or it's just like surprise? All of them. I like the policymakers, the researchers, the yeah. punks, the activists, okay. the techies, the mm. artists. Mm. All of them. Yeah. Okay. Even people just joining in randomly. Yeah. Like, I saw the door open. Yeah. It's gonna be good. Okay. So people gate crashes as well. A bit of random. We like a bit of random as well. Well, can I ask you a question, Solly? Are you a, are you a freak? 
It depends. Yeah. <laughs> it depends who you ask, I mean. Okay. All maybe, right. Yeah. Is Zero. anyone here self identified This is Uruguay, maybe. Yeah. Finland are you a freak are you more of a freak in Finland or more of a freak in Uruguay? That's a very good question. I think in both. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Anyone else self-identify as a freak? I feel, I feel like we can be a freak uh, in uh, if we're in the right setting. We can be a freak of that precise setting. I think yeah. we're all, all of us are the freak for people. Like yeah. she said, yeah. it depends on who you ask. Yeah. So maybe maybe if you fi if you look. Uh, no. <laughs> Hang on a second. Uh, apparently, we're, we're, we're looking for freaks. We're looking for freaks. <laughs> yeah, go, go. Yeah, but like, yeah. I feel like we're uh, we're all. If yeah. we find, uh, we search enough, we can find who, for whom we are a freak. Mm. So uh, we'll always be. Everyone will be a freak to some. Apparently, we were his freaks. Yeah. 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 Obviously, he yeah. he ran away practically. Yeah. The yeah. guy. Okay. So everyone is a freak to somebody. Um, but does that mean conversely, none of us are freaks here because we're all kind of part of the same thing? Do you? Could it get more freaky? Activists, entrepreneurs, always crazy people mm. label like women, dangerous, crazy. Dangerous so that's also people. when you're settling too much, then you need something. You yeah. need your feet getting a bit, you know, a bit more yeah. tickly or something. You need a bit more of a freak. You need or either to join a freak movement or yeah. okay. people thinking so differently or future. We need a bit of tickling. We need a bit of like what is going to actually, you know, freak people out here today. Do we need to have a freaky conversation? Sometimes people, uh, yeah. sometimes people are actively d choosing to act like freaks to tickle people. Right. Like yeah. uh, sometimes we, we act a bit edgy. Now? Like we're bit, yeah. I think yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think we, we can all be all mm -hmm. be a bit like a bit of an edge lord mm -hmm. in a sense. Like ah, uh, uh, we we. Can I ask you what freaks you out? What freaks you out? My what freaks me out? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what freaks me out are people who don't consider other people. Like I feel like I'm not taking into account of how I'm going to feel. That freaks me out. Like uh, socially, okay. socially freaks me out. Okay. I feel like somebody who won't consider if what they are doing is infringing on what I'm comfortable with and yeah. stuff like stuff like that. My kind of my social safety, something like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I read somewhere that apparently we're living in a world of. Uh, the world that wants to be free of harassment, but secretly people want to be harassed. Well, Discuss. Do you want to be harassed? Well, I mean, I think, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, because there's yeah. like, there's this kind of like yeah. fixation on like private mm. space and just like, no, I just mm. do my things in my own way, but actually yeah. we're kind of shutting ourselves off from the world. So, you know, the people who are kind of priding themselves or, you know, or they'll call out harassment, whatever that means for, you know, in, mm. in any given context, but actually secretly we all want to be harassed. Okay. That, that's what I mean. Wow. Well, I say the opposite of lubrication is is friction. Friction. Right? Yeah. Okay, so I think yeah. sometimes conflict and friction are good things. <laughs> yeah. No, so we because need a it's bit more friction. <laughs> well, you're engaging. You're having a yeah. conversation. Maybe you disagree, but you're disagreeing for good reasons. You're sharing information, yeah. knowledge back and forth mm. so that kind of thing mm. it can be too easy in other words yeah. I think okay, sometimes so you need a little okay so we need the social lubrication which we've got but have we got the social friction do we need a bit of friction as well as lubrication and what's going to provide the friction tonight <laughs> yeah yeah you I think we need some kind of debate. Yeah, you think so? Well, what, yeah. do you, what do you think people disagree on around this table? You probably know. <laughs> oh, wow, well, here. Yeah. Um, apparently, about like what's uh, harassment and what's yeah. social interaction, maybe? Okay, I mean, where does friction become harassment? Is there like a. A solid line? Is there like a? Is it a grey area? Mm. Are we too? <laughs> this is this is yeah. really touchy. Yeah. So that that might okay, that might are. create friction now. Space. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with him because uh, it's kind of there is a grey area, but like I think I think I think it's about if you try to be considerate with the other you can try to f f have friction with somebody mm. without mm, without be uh, while making sure you're not make, doing harm i feel like there's a difference here the harm you can do or asking yourself is okay. you could be doing harm. Just, just be sensitive to harm. Sati, did you want to say something? Oh, I said easy friction. Don't give food to the people. Okay. Yeah, they would, they would want, would not want to socialize at all. Have 
Yeah. And they're like, no free food, man, and no free socialize. When I'm leaving. Okay. Right, okay, so the free drinks, the free drinks provide the lubrication. The lack of free food provides the friction. Exactly. Okay, so we've got no, no, no alcohol, no food. No fun. Yeah, go. On. No, I say a good, a good friction is yeah. your football team sucks. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's good friction. <laughs> then you get then you get a conversation, and it may be very true as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. In, in my case, yes, it is. Uh, definitely. What's your football team? What's, my, What's your football team? It's a small East London team oh. called. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sucks, obviously it sucks. America, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it called Chelsea? No, 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 they're, they're, they're West London. But anyway, uh, uh, we don't talk about them. Uh, we've got song about them. But anyway, it's not about me. What were you going to say, Solly? Would you say something? No, also bad, bad coffee in some cultures could be like bad food could, could ignite some yeah. conflict. Yeah. I know Italians can be very. F yeah. Which, which one? Oh. English food. Is there any particular type of English food that you? Oh. Each, every, every, every one of it, every piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What is it about the British or English and foods um, that is so wrong? Yeah. I, I, I couldn't define. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just can't do it. Yeah, I can define it. Every anything yeah. I, we can we can yeah. eat in England, Sc Scottish uh, food yeah. seems a bit better than uh, other. One. But I'm saying yeah. this I mm. as a French, so that's yeah. why maybe my advice. Yeah. My, uh, I mean, are the, I mean, conversely, are the French a little bit too over focused on foods? Yes. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, I can say I can say it. Yeah. I can say it. <laughs> okay, well, well, the problem is too much agreement here. Come on. Yeah, yeah, it's too yeah. agreeable. If you need yeah. more friction. Okay, what? Where are you from, Richard? I'm from the United States, California. Oh, yeah. Well, is it, what's the food like there? Food's pretty good. Yeah. The wine, the wine is better than this shit. I'll tell yeah. you that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're creating some friction. Uh, I mean, um, is this a hungry mob that we're kind of generating here? Are people going to riot for foods? And is there any foods, you know, is it going to be a success? Free food. Free food. Free food. Is there any free food? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, where is it? also reached the level of cutting off the internet, like wife, no Wi-Fi. What would happen? Okay. All right, so that's a very good point there. What would happen if we actually cut off the Wi-Fi here? How would people here. respond? How would people respond? Is that how to create... Blackout. Yeah. World inter internet blackout. Would that create an angry mob? I don't know. Okay. What do people think? <laughs> we should try it. Okay. I mean, we've got the people. We, we've got all these techie people. They, they know how to turn off the. T they know where the switch is. So yeah. We would run out of alcohol really fast. Okay. That's what I think. <laughs> I mean, would it, would it be a good experiment to do, just to turn off the internet for how long, how long? We could, we, we could scaffold it or, or just make it abruptly, like one month. A month? Okay. Okay, well, how would people feel if we turn off the internet for a month? Yeah. It would rise natality, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. People will, get people will get bored easily and no Netflix, you will get more... Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of bread baking. More bread baking. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, who would be here? Rise nine, mo nine months later. Big, big birth yeah. increases. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do, do people uh, agree with this idea? Should we turn off? Maybe not for a month, but for a, a period of time. Should we turn off the internet? No, 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 no. no? Because we would be obliged, uh, obliged to first forced to talk to each other, so yeah. that's not a good thing, we should no. not, um, yeah, yeah. no. Okay, so you definitely know. Who says we should turn off the internet? Friction from the intersections of friction and lubrication. Mm. Yes. Wow. Uh, we yeah. <laughs> well, well, we've moved on now, we're now talking about, because of you, we're talking about turning off the internet, which I think is a good subject. Yes. Uh, but how long could people go without the internet? I think it would like destroy the supply chain now, so yeah. it would be dramatic. I think. But on the phone, if they turn internet only, turn off only on their phone and entertainment so devices, like based internet, would yes, be gone. like let the supply chain and everything exist. Like okay. for fun for basic functioning of the society, yeah, those are there. But only on the phone, we turn that off. 
Okay, what, what, would you subscribe to this and how long do you think the period should be? Oh, I'll just go off the grid. I'll, 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 I'll go... You've got no problem with it. Yeah, no, I'll go in jungle. I mean, do you think... <laughs> <laughs> would, it, would it be a good experiment for the world to do it, do you think? Do you... I think so, it will and, be a great experiment. Um, <laughs> and what... Everything kind of what kind of period of time should we do it for? At least for a week, and we come out, uh, come yeah. out, come back, and people will identify as internet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> people will identify as internet. Okay. Is that what you said? Okay. So we're, we're talking. Yeah. Yeah. So we are talking about. I think there. I think there is some traction to this idea of turning off, the, turning off the internet for a limited period, only on phones, maybe, maybe personal computers as well. Yeah. Going back to TV times, or also TV would be oh, no. already dead okay. to digital. Do you think? Do you want to turn off the TV as well? I don't know. I don't know what would happen. Would we go back to like mm. uh, phones with the mm. cord? And I was mm. teaching my nieces how to use that, and they were asking if they had a camera. Mm. We still have it. My mom's house. There is a phone with a cord, and yeah. the, my niece was asking, "Does it have a camera?" Yeah. Okay. So no FaceTime on that kind of phone. Uh, yeah. Um, I heard about a guy who is a developer, and he mm. got given a task to develop a kosher smartphone for an orthodox community in Israel mm. and uh, so he was mm. like yeah sure I'll try it but it was mm. completely like he, he mm. this just broke this man <laughs> because yeah. the kosher phone had no no ability I, I, I don't know what it actually had but there was no apps no access to radio no access to internet no access yeah. to video phone calls no access to text messages so I think it was just essentially just to give people the experience of using a smartphone without actually any yeah. content and I thought it was just like so, yeah. so okay is it you saying it's a new trend no I, I think it's a, it's a new trend there's even mm. people that is buying their own phones uh, yeah. like stupid phones let's say like uh, old time phones yeah. dumb phones yeah yeah, yeah. Like, a, yeah like a, a candy yeah. bar phone. yeah, yeah. Mm. and mm. I, in a sense I kind of agree because mm. uh, I feel like at some point we are very much distracted. Like, mm. if at some point I'm watching a TV series or a, or a mm. movie or something, I'm taking out the phone for, ah, let's see if uh, somebody has yeah. contacted so me or something. you can't even watch TV without checking Yeah, the yeah, but, but I see it yeah. in my friends as well. Like, uh, yeah. we're, we're at the cinema, we're watching yeah. a movie, and you see people, like, taking out the... Yeah, phone, taking, yeah. they, checking out Twitter, or yeah. it's like, wow, so it's two hours, so we cannot... Yeah. yeah. Have you seen... People even do, they'll just take out your phone for no fucking reason, they'll just unlock it and then lock it again and put them in the pocket. <laughs> That's the most weird thing. And they're so, so frequently, man, why? Just a little dopamine. Just a little. Yeah. little. Yeah. 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 You're describing the freak right now. Yeah. Yeah. Total freak. Yeah. I, do, I do that, by the way, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, okay, so we're talking about, let's ask the photographer person, would you subscribe to turning off the internet for... For a week or for a month, or you know, let's pa pass the mic over and tell us your name, and we'll give you a round of applause. Uh, I'm Emma. <laughs> um, yeah, I would uh, turn off the internet for a month. I think. For a month. Yeah, I think okay. it would be great. What would you think would happen? Would we um, would we reset? Yeah, I think so. I think. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, I think we get a lot of distractions from the internet. Mm. So if we just put it off for a month, we I don't know. Mm. It could be a little bit more quieter, or uh, yeah. get more social. I think, maybe, in different ways. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I mean, I mean, the Mozilla Foundation is all about an open and fair and free internet. But what about a closed internet? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, the, maybe we should readdress. <laughs> should it it's called China? Okay. Oh. Friction. Oh. Okay. Friction. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. An intermittent internet. You have uh, uh, internet hours over spe yeah. specific periods okay. over the day. Yeah. So like, like they do. Do you have that in Switzerland? No. no. But, uh, I mean, yeah. they don't do. They don't do the um, the internet thing. But for instance, if you want to do your laundry in a in a shared building, right. you've got designated I know, hours. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's that's aware that's of that. Yeah. But maybe internet is like. But I, I feel like yeah. You t you told about uh, that we need the idle time and the idle brain time, uh, yeah. which is uh, like now. I, I pull my phone whenever there's nothing to do actively. Yeah. I, I, uh, what's, when the last time somebody here uh, ate their meal without checking their phone, just ate. Mm. I don't know. I, I did. I did it yesterday to uh, for the exercise. Like to do. Okay, I'm going to try. It was hard. Yeah. It was fucking hard. Well, and we need some foods. We need some foods to actually try this out. So uh, <laughs> uh, where's the food? 
There is no free food. No friction. 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 So the, the next time we check out, we eat without checking our phones will not be now. Okay. But you know how they say mm. that the you know the development like development in the world is just so fast. Mm. Uh, it's like it's faster as this is than mm. uh, than it's ever been. I mm. wonder what would ha like what is the period of time they would need to like switch off from the internet before you start noticing? Oh shit, the world has really changed. You know, is a month enough to notice? There's well, been you like go for more than a month. No, no, I'm, I'm just yeah. curious because I think that the speed of development is like increasing uh, and increasing. Mm, mm. So if I switch off by a month, am I going to miss out on an, a lot or not so much? Okay. Or if I switch off for a year? Like for a year, okay. Yeah. I have to be. Okay. <laughs> well, that, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Pe people. Hang on, hang on, hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Uh, uh, I just want to say this is a free form talk show. You can come and go. You can come and go as you want to, and that applies to everybody. Don't feel like you've got to stay here and take part of this conversation. Sonny. There is a business model. Actually, people are paying for a re uh, forest shower yeah. or buying. I saw at the supermarket some mm. small cages for you to lock in your phone. Yeah. So there's a business model. Also, could be you pay something for a month without an internet, mm. two months, six months. You you yeah. name it. So it's like a <laughs> it's like an yeah. internet unsubscription. Yeah. Yes. So, so we yeah. We already lived um, a moment where we were limited in our socialization, mm. which was uh, where it was COVID. Mm. So maybe it's a good um, view of how we could behave without mm. internet for a month mm. I don't know okay. could we do it could we do it I think there was a mm. lot of uh, good um, aftermath of mm. COVID about this mm. like people got more time to think because there's like a lot of people that mm. were out of work mm. and had a lot of free time at their home mm. where they couldn't do anything and they just had to sit on the couch them? and and think for a while which doesn't happen in a really fast western life was it beneficial to have that time that free time for me and a lot of my friends it was yeah mm. Th that's another topic covid hobbies yeah. like uh, <laughs>、uh, no, Covid hobby is a community community garden. I did、uh, oh, something. Nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a nice one. Round of applause for that. I'm I'm maybe too ashamed to talk about it. Okay. Yeah. I break everything in my garden. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made pizza. Pizza. Okay.、Yeah. Uh, was it a French style pizza, Italian style? No, I, I cannot talk about that.、Uh, okay. That was too shameful.、Uh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It was pizza. Pineapple.、Uh, yeah. uh, I adopted dogs and gave them back right away. Whoa. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so almost, yeah, like Schrodinger's dog kind of thing. Yeah. Didn't really exist.、Uh, you know, the family quizzes. Family quizzes. Family quizzes always.、Okay. Yeah, I've got a button for that. Just yeah, yeah. Just those. Who won the family quiz? Did you win it? Oh yeah, of course. Okay,、right. Of course. <laughs>、yeah. um, okay.、Uh, all right. So,、uh, I mean, do people feel like it was a, it was actually a good period? I mean, obviously there was you know there was some bad things to it, but did we come out of it with new skills, new ideas, new thoughts, new perspectives, or yeah, yeah, or depression? Yeah. Yeah,、uh, it was horrible. <laughs> Personally, like I really missed the the real in、uh, oh fuck、uh, in real life contact,、mm. social, contact, mm. like contact mm. social contact, like physical social contact was really hard for me. For example,、mm. I I know people. Some people st strived in during、uh, lockdown because、yeah. they were. Not forced to have interactions, but I, I personally really struggled. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when you came back, did you, were you like rushing to hug lots of people? Or no, the, the hugging, the hugging part of the physical contact was actually the opposite. I was very glad, like in in, in Belgium and French-speaking、mm. countries, we, we there's la bise, and I was. 
so fucking glad that it was normalized not to have forced all obligatory bees. Like uh, we, you could say, no, okay, no, okay, no, yeah. hi, and now he's back to you for you're fucking supposed to do a bees. I don't want the bees. I, I want to hug my friends, okay. but I, if I if I want to choose, I wanted to be able to choose the the yeah. the, the greeting, the form of greeting, yeah. like yeah, yeah, exactly. Hang on, hang on. We want a final thought from you two before you go. It doesn't <laughs> give us a final thought. It could be anything. It'd be like, you know, why are you here in Mozfest? What are you hoping to get from it? What's been the best comment made on the table? It could be your journey here. It could be looking forward to doing something else that is not Mozfest anymore. Anything. Just give us something. Final thought. Here for friction. Friction. Okay. All right. And what do you think the big friction things are going to be? Uh, the big tech companies don't care about the environment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, and he leaves. Okay, yeah, that's dropping the bomb. Uh, okay. Uh, um, give us a final thought. Lubrication. Lubrication. Oh, what's this? What's this? Thank I don't you. know. I found it on the way. Okay. <laughs> it was on the floor. I yeah, got one okay. from Okay. <laughs> Did you find this in the urinals? No, no. It's a sour uh, game. Uh, okay, all right. Um, uh, have you, anything else? Any other final thought? Sati? Oh no, this is my first time in Europe. Yeah. So welcome to Europe. Yeah. So welcome. <laughs> and I'm gonna probably like we're gonna roam around in Amsterdam now. Yeah. It was raining the whole day yesterday. Mm. So yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah. Any uh, any advice? So for any, any suggestions? Any suggestions? Get lost. Yeah. Get lost in the streets in of Amsterdam. Yeah. It's yeah. impossible yeah. to leave without a story. Get lost, but in a good way. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's uh, in most of the streets. <laughs> yeah, okay, get lost. Yeah. yeah. Follow the red light. Follow <laughs> the red light. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Where are we going to go with this conversation? Do we want to pick up on the big bomb that has dropped? By was it Tom? I can't yeah, remember. Tom. He didn't say enough. He didn't say enough. But um, big tech companies don't care about the environment. Or do we want to stick on what we were talking about? Uh, about the COVID, about COVID that. recovery. It's, it's up to you. The whole, look, we are the people speak, and we are the people speak. There you go. You can have one. Is that the reason why we are that? Is because it's up to you to decide what you want to talk about, not me. So, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about the environment, big tech companies, the environment? Do you want to talk about uh, having to kiss people in on the, on the, on the, on the, cheek, on the cheek? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, have to say, I have to say, I find it awkward, but I thrive on awkwardness, so it's okay. Yeah. I, f I feel somehow mm. that it's more awkward now, that yeah. it's not like, before COVID it was obvious that you had like, yeah. this way to greet people, and now yeah. there's always someone mm. that says, oh mm. no, I don't, and mm. so you, you don't mm. know if you, so there's like a new awkwardness, but yeah. not knowing exactly what to do so you have to ask before mm. and mm. it's weird yeah. so uh, hug, uh, yeah. fist the bump etc like i feel like people saw that they could enforce a boundary of a now wanting a physical contact and some yeah. people had a taste of it it's like oh shit mm. feels great mm. i don't have to do it so now i can mm. do it i will i will do it yeah uh, personally i think it's good Come to Richard, Carl, Richard, say that. I'm yeah, right. no, I went to a conference a couple of years ago during COVID, and they had these stickers and yeah. said, I'm huggable, yeah. or I will shake hands, or yeah. I, I prefer my distance. What's and it gave people saying? signals, mine's huggable, because that's okay, the way right, I am. Right, but, yeah. you know, yeah. but I mean, it was it was actually nice. You got social cues yeah. expressly, and now it's like, I don't know what my cue is anymore. Right, okay. <laughs> do I know yeah. you? I think I know you. Can yeah, I hug I mean, you? Do I don't you, think I want to hug you. Do you ever get it wrong? Sure, all the time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly in bars late at night with women. But I mean, that's yeah. another thing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's we're back question. to the, well, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> where, uh, where are we going to go with this conversation? Where are we going to go with this conversation? Do we want to talk about this, exactly this thing about the, yeah? This. No, but I think like stickers, I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced about the stickers because I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit, it's a risky business when you speak to people. And yeah, sometimes you get it wrong, but I think essentially your gut feeling is right. Sometimes mm -hmm. what you, you may want to do, Gut. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm surprised about this 
kissing because I, I really I, I really like you that because you, do, do you get it right I mean where are you from you have to do it um, people at the same mm. table. no well <laughs> three because I'm from Poland if, you go, if you're gonna if you're going to do it if you're going to do the kisses in Poland you're going to go for three but what we used to do we don't do it so much anymore maybe guys of like a maybe slightly older generation but it's kissing women on the hand I don't know if, have you ever experienced that mm. yeah mm. but it, and it's just like such a weird thing and like essentially I think it's supposed to be a nice thing but somehow it's easier to say no if somebody's going for a kiss on the cheek mm. and you don't really want to but this is just like it's just a hand but it's just like uh, I, I can't bear that so maybe I've got double standards I don't okay. know <laughs> so right. hand, yeah. Yeah. Three in the cheek. Yeah. Yeah, okay so this is only one kiss on the hand not three yeah. you've only got it yeah. it's not like no, no, okay, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, there's kind of a uh, sexist thing about this. Yeah. Uh, mm. Like in France, for instance, mm. in some regions, mm. you would kiss a woman but shake hands with a man. Mm. Uh, mm. It's not the case in the south so much, so much, yeah. but still. Yeah. So, what mm. does it tell about a society if you start an interaction with another person differently uh, from which sex mm. she belongs to? Yeah. Okay, is it a little bit sexist? Uh, uh, you're not from Europe, just like Satish. Well, how do they do it? How do they do it? They hug everybody. Just hug. No, actually, yeah. the side, the sideways hug. The sideways hug. Men and women, you sort of do this. Hey. Yeah. Around the shoulder. Yeah. yeah. A sideways yeah. hug. So you're not straight in. Yeah. And you're not just doing this. It's sort of a. Uh, it's, it's in between. Okay. Is that? A, a, that seems. I don't know. Meeting? I don't know if it's universal, but I've seen. I've yeah. done it, and I've seen a lot of people do that. Yeah. It's in between. Yeah. Okay, the side hug. We're learning all the time. Side hug. Yeah. There's space. There's yeah. space issues. And yeah. it's, it's men and women. Okay. So it's not sexist either. It's just no, sort of, it's, 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 sort of it's sort of uniform. Okay. All right. So the side hug, will it ever be adopted? It's, it's, it's interesting because there are two things crossing. There's intimacy and, and formality. Because mm. uh, you have to... The, the, mm. uh, I think it was a Jordan and Peel uh, sketch mm. when you have a, like a, a, someone who's supposedly a president or something like that mm. and he goes in a, a row of people, he shakes hand one, he's like, oh dude! Da, 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 and then the, other, the next one he shakes hand very tamely yeah. and then another one, he's like, uh, 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 an intricate... Uh, Mm. Yeah, something like that. But like, it's the the level of formality, and that if you very n mm. informal with someone, can you be formal with the next one? Is okay, it okay? Yeah. Like, right. uh, so it's also about. It's not just about uh, gender and formality, but it's also sequentiality as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, give us a final thought. Inigo. No, this has been mm. lovely. It, it mm. is nice. Mm. I don't know what to say. Mm. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to use this opportunity to say we are here for the whole of the festival. Not necessarily here. We don't know where we're going to be because of the weather. Yeah. We're supposed to be outside, but will we be outside? We don't know. Anyway, think of things to say. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be any of the things we talked about. It could be anything. Yeah, just like when, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, what to say now? this is what I needed to say. That, then come to us tomorrow and say your thing. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay, final thoughts. Final? Oh, you're not going, you're staying. Okay, okay. All right, no, just thoughts. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's nothing. Yeah, nothing. Okay, all right, you're not thinking anything. Uh, okay, all right, there's some hugging going on. Or oh, we can observe this. It's side hugging, it's a slapping. Uh, hey, here yeah. we are. What are we talking about? What is going on here? Yeah. Okay, side hug. Don't forget to feed the freak. Okay, feed the freak. Feed the freak. Keep it connected. Are you off then? So you you are all going. So let's get. Okay, your job. Are you going as well? We can We're here the whole time, so don't worry about us. But uh, as I was saying to Satish, come and go as you want to. It's kind of up to you. But we do like a final thought because, for example, Tom dropped the big bomb. Our tech company is doing it. Do they really care about the environment? Anyway, final thoughts. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. I, I, you can do better than that, I think. What are you thinking as you go? Uh, yes, it would be a wonderful evening. Yeah, okay, we do have <laughs> so, a question. What the, why does it say data for good on your jumper? Mm. Oh, I have to sit down. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we play the sad music. He has to. Okay. <laughs> Okay. No, it's a French uh, association. Yeah. But uh, 
meet, yeah. make people meet each other with an yeah. association that wants to do data project and a volunteer mm. who wants to work for data project and so internet social media who make people meet each other and uh, to work mm. together to accelerate some project around mm. data and AI. Okay, yeah. we're going to give you a round of applause yes, for that. Yes. Okay, Richard, Seven. final thought? Um, Are you data for bad? <laughs> yeah, I, I, may, yeah, yeah, yeah. May your life be an optimal blend of friction and lubrication. Okay. Okay. We've got. Uh, you will see on the dance floor. Yeah. Uh, we've got the gaff tape and the WD40 for that. Uh, okay. Where do we go with this conversation? Do we want to talk about the back, back to the friction? Do we want to talk about the uh, data companies really caring about the environment? We do. We want to talk about something else. Well, yeah. Or maybe the environment in the workplace. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no. I, no. Actually, I, I don't know what to say because I don't. I don't fully mm. understand like this I mean, whole data uh, stuff. I, do you? I mean, do you in your workplace? Do you get to sort of have any input on the environment? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I have to say that you were talking about COVID uh, mm. uh, preoccupations, but I've left my old job during COVID because I, I just realised mm. I just don't like the environment. I mean, people were nice, but something really like. Mm bad happens when you work in a hierarchical organization like kind of structured structure of managers and stuff and then there's like an office culture which i just realize i really just don't like it i don't enjoy mm. it so um yeah so where i'm working right now is i feel like i i can shape the environment around me and it's fun environment so. where are you working now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I am working as part of an art collective <laughs> in East London, yeah. and um, yeah, we're, we operate from a tiny studio which doubles up as an office, workshop, uh, just general hangout space, coffee, awesome. coffee place with one yeah. tiny coffee machine, social place, nursery, nursery, a crash mm. for adults mm. and children alike, mm. free mm. food, yeah, sometimes as well, All so. Microwaved. A microwaved yeah. chips next door. Yeah. So everybody's welcome. If you ever come to London, We've come sold to East the London. Pizza oven, sadly. Yeah, actually, it's yeah. true. Anyway, it looks like you two are also shaping. You've already done your final thought. Give us a final thought. Um, it's first. It's a beautiful table. Oh, thank um, you. Thank where you. did you buy it? <laughs> no, I didn't buy it. I made it. <laughs> made it actually I, I had some help with this this is called Texalium this Texalium surface was actually made by a guy called Marzi who did the casting but we designed the shape and then got it cast Seen, seen, top yeah. of the pops. Well, I grew up on top of the pops, so possibly there's an influence there. I don't know. Uh, I watched like upcycling, upcycling, yeah. top of the pops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least upcycling the ideas, some of the ideas, anyway. So yes, this was made specially for talking. You can, we can make one for you though, if you, you know. But obviously, we have to discuss. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll wire you the money. Okay, cool. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Hopefully, you're here all week. We can discuss discuss terms. Um, it does actually take a long time to get this done as well, even though it looks like it. And it um, floating on this. Mm. Does this float? Yeah. Can, you, can you put it yeah. on the canal? Yeah, it's fine to come here, but the tr tricky bit is coming back to the UK because the current... Yeah. You should think of a pool one or, or a canal yeah. one. We were just thinking mm. that last year we did uh, an mm. event where there was like a free swimming pool mm. for people taking part in the uh, festival. And you know, swimming pool is such an underexplored area for human interaction. And we thought if this was a rubber dinghy with a microphone suspended, you know, mm. so th I, I'm a big advocate yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's there. It's in the yeah, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. It's in the notebook somewhere, like a hot tub, a hot tub version of this, I think would be really good. But we need quite a big hot tub, I think. Um, but anyway, maybe you're willing to fund that with your organization. What's it called? Carbon? Is it carbon? Thingy? Code Carbon, yeah. yeah. We work together yeah. on this. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so. they, they could help us to fund the hot tub Tokyoki? Uh, I would like to fund, you, you say? Yeah, or funds. Oh, no, fund. we don't have any money. I mean, except, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. I mean, Maybe yeah. we could like buy mm. a quarter of a hot tub, you know. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We could put, I mean, we could maybe we do some kind of Kickstarter for it. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to hit you with a round of applause. Uh, are you off as well? Yeah. Give us a final thought. 
I've already said uh, feed the freak, don't turn the Wi-Fi longer yeah. than a month without consent. Yeah. And find <laughs> find that sweet spot between friction and lubrication. Okay. We'll all be all right. That's a very very good sum up of the entire conversation. Thank you very much. We will see, as I said to everyone else, think of things to say in, over the next two days because we're going to need some topics. Maybe you've got some topics for us. No, no topics. Stay back there. No, yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, no, yeah. It's got no topics. I'm going to be way too busy. I'm going to give you topics to suggest. Yeah, just suggest some topics. But I'm not doing it on mic. Okay, all right, all right, okay. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Exactly. We, we could be, be in the garden if the weather's nice, but we will be there. I mean, you, you won't miss it. I hope. Mm. Smoke. Yeah. Well, this is this is my theory. You should be worried. No, but you know something like smoking in itself has just got such a bad rep for health reasons, and I understand yeah. that. But, but no, no, no. But you know what? Like people, it's. I think it, what what's more damaging when you're bored or you don't quite know what to talk about mm. to reach for a cigarette or reach for the phone. Cigarettes. Friend or foe or mm. phone. Friend or foe or phone. Yeah. Yeah. Friend or foe workshop. Don't get FOMO from your phone. FOMO. Oh, yes. Okay. I think we'll leave it there for this session. Thank you, everyone. The second part. So um, let's do a round of names. So my name is Margot. This is Sukiyaki. Okay, okay, what's your name? My name is Mikey. I'm Mikey. And we've got the plant, obviously, and we've got somebody on the camera trying to focus a manual, uh, uh, an automatic lens, I which I appreciate. I it's an automatic. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, but you need to do it with a button. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we've got a multi talent there on the cameras. I've got something I want to kick off with, actually. It's like I was in the toilet and I actually heard your whole shtick in the toilet. Which I don't normally do because normally I'm in a different toilet. Were we in the same toilet? We were in the same room, not in the same compartment. But I had heard you all. To come. Yes, yes, come and join us. Yes, we need, we need meat, we need meat in the room. Yes, okay. I've been called to have dinner, yeah. so I can't really like. Okay, well you can, you can at least give us your name. So I'll give you a, I'll give, I'll give you a one-minute scoop. Okay. Well, give us your name to start with. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gunner. Hi Gunner, we've got Mikey, we've got Hish and Margo. Uh, let's just give this person's name. Uh, Alia. Alia, nice to meet you. And this person's name? Uh, I'm Richard again. With a grape beer, <laughs> as I believe this is called. So uh, so right now we don't have any subjects to, to discuss because the third part of Tokioki. Gunnar, did you, do you have something for us? Uh, the the fried deep fried cauliflowers were amazing. It's they were really nice. super yeah. delicious. Okay. What? Okay, uh, where, where do they come from? Who deep fries them? Is this the healthiest thing you can have? Is it even point of food to be healthy? Well, the, where I live, they do a very good deep fried broccoli tempura. What but is tempura? It's like, a, I think it's some kind of Japanese. It's basically like what they do naturally in Glasgow is like just deep fry everything in batter. But the Japanese do it in a much more healthy... I don't think anything anyone's ever in Glasgow deep fried a piece of broccoli. Okay. But maybe, you know, I've not been there for a long, long time. Double Oreos. Oh. Okay. No, no. Have you ever deep fried anything? Double Oreo stuff. They have that at the county fairs in, in the USA. So you get the double the double stuff Oreos and you deep fry them. Yeah. You, you've had it? Like, how, how would you describe the flavor? That's why I'm, I'm just interested in how do you describe the deep fried? Come and join us. Have you ever eaten deep fried food? Have you ever deep fried anything? <laughs> Come and join us. This is a talk show, and you're on it right now. So welcome. We've got. Uh, that's okay, and so am I. And this is this is where everything makes sense. So uh, right now we've got Hish over there. We've got Mike. We've got Gunnar. We've got uh, Alia. Alia. We've got Richard. I'm Margaret. What's your name? Becca. Becca. You know, I always prefer to hear it like verbally than than read it because I just I, I just can't read on the spot. Uh, that's something they've learnt about me. Uh, there you go. So right now we've been talking about um, different deep fried things. Uh, Gunnar suggested um, a deep fried uh, cauliflower. We're talking about deep fried Oreo cookies. Uh, we're talking about tempura. We're talking about Glasgow. Uh, we're talking about Richard explaining what I'm doing, which is I'm really <laughs> grateful for. But right now you said you are familiar with the flavour of deep fried Oreos. What? The hell? 
is my question. <laughs> it's great. If you're ever in New York, uh, go to Ray's Candy Store in the East Village. Uh, best deep fried Oreos in New York City. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so yeah. I'll, I'll one up you on this. This is like oh, the yeah. most American thing ever. When I was in college, people would have deep frying parties where you would like, they would be deep frying stuff. You show up with like whatever you want to put in the pot and they would deep fry it and you'd be like, I wonder what a deep fried, like, I don't know, celery tastes like. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, pickle, pickles are really good deep fried, yeah. Okay, okay, right, so now, like, who knew that in Mo Mosfest 2024, deep fried food is going to be such a massive subject? So, did you go to university in Glasgow? Because we're hearing that uh, they deep fried anything there, but from the healthy stuff. Where did you go to university? In the US. Just all of it. Yeah, all of it. Okay. No, I was in Utah. <laughs> Okay, uh, right, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, what's the point of deep frying something that is healthy? Mm. Balance. To destroy all the health. Balance. 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 balance, but what are you, but what, what are you balancing? This is my, this is my question, what are you balancing? Right, I don't normally eat, I'm, I mean, I do like broccoli, but I don't normally eat broccoli, but this restaurant has got, the, with the deep fried broccoli, they've kind of hit the jackpot because it tastes like chips, but it's actually healthy. So is it about disguising the, 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 um, you know, the good flavors, the healthy foods into something you know, deep fried and unhealthy just to entice people to a healthy lifestyle? I mean, it's, yeah. it's like having the experience of, of being a little bit naughty, but also <laughs> being morally conscious. And so is eating deep fried cauliflower for you, Gunnar, is that being a bit naughty? Or well, the, the deep fried crust of it, the outsides of it, they give the associations of me eating unhealthy food. Whereas if I know that there's cauliflower inside, there's there's like the veggies that as a kid. Okay. Uh, so if you're good about the Previous yeah. session that would have been described as freaky. Freaky. Okay, freaky. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, okay. Wait, that's, that freaks you out. Come and join us. This is talk show. We're talking about being freaky uh, and deep fried food. Okay, give us final thoughts. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Any final yeah. thoughts? That was, wow. <laughs> okay. So there you go, here we are, just talking about being freaks. And just don't mind every, us. Everybody leave by speaking of freakishness. Yeah, yeah. well that's my special power. We already knew you were a freak. You, you made that pretty clear previous time. <laughs> so, I mean, is pushing people away of conversation necessarily a bad thing? Maybe we can get to a deeper level. We're talking about deep frying food, but can we deep fry this conversation? <laughs> well. Well, I mean, I think just to bring in the freak thing, it's almost like that sort of like the subversiveness, like a deep fried idea is actually like, you know, there could be something subversive inside that batter, the deep fried batter, but I'm not quite got the whole thought of it exactly that. So I think it's something about that, that, you know, the freak, if you've got a deep fried freak, I'm not suggesting frying people, yeah. but do you know what I'm, what I'm trying to say? What about deep fried data? What would that be like? Would it be data for good or would it be data that you think is good at the inside but it's evil on the outside? Exactly. Or, or the opposite, so something like, or, or that uh, deep fried data would be, would be data that's damaged and you have to find the good in it. Oh, I don't know. Frying okay. is, is a good process. I mean, fried with tech, I associated with damage, like uh, my my computer fried or something like that. So it's maybe the, uh, yeah, it would be a dam something that damaged, got damaged. I don't know. Okay, so do we need to uh, demystify or I don't know, update the meaning of, of fried computers? I mean, is that something that should be on the menu or does that belong in a repair shop? Like like what's what, what's with that? I mean, is there any problem with data? You see, I had a different idea about it. it took, for me, it's like almost like passing the good information yeah. inside the clickbait or inside the kind of things that you know like people. What like I don't know. Like you could, like for example, this this idea of deep fried data could be like good public health messaging or mental health messaging. Like you know, like hundred reasons why you're just a rubbish person. Do you know what I mean? But actually, when you click on it, it's actually, you know, it's got some good mental health advice. You see, that's some, what, to me, what deep fried data is. It's like the, the good described, the, concealed in something tasty. I'm gonna, 
ask this person over there, have you ever deep fried your data? Have you ever ignored a talk show? It's, I think it's a, it's a yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I remember when I, uh, when I was uh, researching into uh, buying a, uh, getting a, a single speed bike, I was like reading articles and there was one article on a bike store that sold a lot of uh, single speed bike that, w that was saying all oh, the advantages of uh, driving a single speed bike, oh it, it's, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a very good, it's a better exercise, you feel, feel very, you have a very good sensation with your bike and you're, you're, you feel closer to it, you, you have a good, you're one with your bike, stuff like that, and I was like, wow, that's such fucking bullshit, and now I, I own a, a single speed bike, and I was like, ah, actually they were right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you, have you achieved like a higher or deeper sense of, I don't know, spirituality, being no. one with it's your, spiritual. yeah, it's yeah. More, uh, yeah. Physical, it's more, it's more physical, like you really, since you're setting your own speed, you, you have no settings to go to have an easier time pedaling or harder time pe pedaling. You're you're setting your own speed, so you have a, a different contact, but it's not a spiritual contact at all. It's more like very physical. Is a sensation of pedaling is really you drive you drive yourself more uh, with more effort. Um, uh, Richard, but do you do you uh, set your own speed in life? I do, but I assume that the single speed was just because he's a cheap bastard. I had nothing to do with, you know, being one with whatever. He just didn't want to go for the, so you know, the electric bike with the 37 shifts and, you know, could go up Mount Everest and back and so all that. So is it a bit kind of like um, uh, frying the, the, the message too much? Have, you, have, have they fry, <laughs> fried it dry they, yeah, with this thing? Yeah, they fried it a bit. They yeah. fried it a bit. Okay. I mean, uh, if we were in Germany, I would say... No, uh, no, no, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't. No, no, not that, not that. I want to say like, what was it are we, yeah, yeah, are yeah, we no, fried? No. What were you going to say? Was there some kind of clickbaity thing you were going to say? No, I'm not going to say it, but anyway, because oh, uh, we might, uh, might, we might, yeah, no, but there's all these people on the internet, not the people watching now, but the people watching in future generations to find out what people were saying at MozFest in 2024. I mean, I mean, are you, are you concerned about that? Is, is that? is that building really like, this is Holland? Is that building, is, <laughs> is that intended to represent the nation as a to, as a, in toto? I mean, how, well, how do you feel about what Mikey was saying? People looking back on you making this comment, is this building Holland in 20 years time? Is that the message that you want to leave for the world? Yeah, why not? Yeah, damn right. Press that button. I mean, okay. It's Tuesday night. I mean, you know, we've you had are a few. Correct. It is only Tuesday There's night. There's been some lubrication, yeah. and that's yeah. like I just had an, you know, yeah, this it's is what Holland. About this building. Also, like it's this is, and then Holland's like really thin. It's like almost yeah. like they're shame. Like what are they saying? I feel that it's a, light, a neon sign, and then in the evening it lights up, so that the Holland gets the, the most attention afterwards. Maybe oh, okay. like, this is you know Belgium, or this is Estonia, and I mean like they're you know swap it out every night. It's a different different country. <laughs> Could be another country. Then? I mean it's interesting because you don't need to have a sign like that in America because wherever you go in America you see American flags, <laughs> so you know what country you're in. Because on the trains there's American flags and the houses there's American flags there. So yeah, you don't need a sign saying this is America. The Holland flag, nobody knew the hell it was. Is that what you're saying? People think it's France or something. Yeah, like, oh, it's got the color. Yeah, you're France. You're evil France. Uh, yeah. What's the significance of the upside down American flag? Is this some kind of a special code? What does it stand yes, for? Yes, it's a code for basically the, the MAGA folks, the Trumpists, who believe the country's gone very wrong, and so they fly the flag upside down to okay. show their disdain for where things are going in the country. I mean, is the flag genre the only kind of area where they kind of make their points? I, I have to say, I feel, I know that, you know, maybe it's different and this is a cultural sense to make this is a bit of a friction, frictious point. But I find that the flags, you know, even even when it comes to like, I mean, I support the, the Palestinians, but I'm just a bit uncomfortable with all the flag waving that you get at the Palestinian rallies because it's just, it's not about a flag. You know, I think it's like, I think reducing large groups of people down to flags, I think that's what I find uncomfortable about. I mean, a flag is just reducing the entire people into something that is just a, essentially a piece of cloth. Is that insulting? Is this actually 
raising awareness? I, I think it's 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 a way of symbolizing the people. I, sometimes I, I feel like uh, the flags don't have the same meaning depending on how they're used. I feel like in uh, w w given Palest Palestine is a country that is hardly recognized and have to fight for the recognition, the, the flag has a different meaning of a well-established country, like for example, I don't know, France, so so nobody here is involved, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, like who who's, who's that has like uh, th three centuries of history and doesn't have to defend their own existence, and then the flag has another meaning, which is a, a feeling of pride about what we achieved and not a revendication to validate our existence. So it, it depends. Then again, if you have to show a, a flag with the, the, the face of every single individual living in the country, it doesn't make any sense either. So yeah. it's symbolism, I guess. So maybe if your country is struggling for the independence, the, the flag kind of has got more weight. I mean, the question is like, are countries struggling for independence now, or is the Palestine Palestine has it bad right now? But actually, we're okay. I'm just wondering. Well, also, I think, uh, I mean, I, I have no problem with the Palestinian flag. I tend to favor, like, what the population is going through is is horrible there. But I also think, unfortunately, it becomes very divisive because once you put the flag or you put a slogan behind it, then it's like, okay, it's me against you. You know, it's Israeli government slash whatever versus, but I mean, I almost wish like, why don't we have like a human flag? A flag just for like human beings and like the human beings in this case, in my, in my own, you know, personal view, are being pummeled by an aggressor coming in and taking, you know, and they're defenseless basically. And I feel like you could, if you take away the cause, which again, I don't disagree with the cause, but you may gain a broader audience if people are like, these are just human beings caught in a terrible situation and uh, through no fault of their own. I mean, can I just ask you, I like the idea of this human flag, but what would that look like? Would they have Mozilla Fest, sorry, MozFest <laughs> colors, or is that actually, that would be like the complete opposite of what I think of human flag. I mean, yeah. I, I think you would get a very good example of uh, absolute friction with nobody getting uh, together on the right color to use. No, I think it's, it's, okay. it's total lubrication. Yeah. It's so smooth, nobody disagrees with it, but then you don't make any progress uh, because I, nobody... Wait, 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 wait. Are we talking about lubrication through flag? Yes. <laughs> okay, this is, this is going to be I think the, uh, the, the human flag would be like a yellow, a yellow circle with a black ring around it and two black dots on the top half and a, and a crescent on the bottom half. What, what would that represent? A smiley face. <laughs> it just represent, it re represents humanity. That's what the human flag would be. And, but a non-specific humanity. It is. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about emojis as a kind of inspiration for flags? I mean, how do you feel about that? But, uh, but what about an emoji flag for a flag? A flag emoji for a flag? No? Like, you, 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 if you if you scroll down in your emoji emoji, you have flags, and you could use one of those, these flags as a flag. No. Okay. Now, and then, but what I wanted actually to say without trolling, <laughs> that, that was troll. That was troll. Um, is uh, like okay, but like so you would summarize humanity to being happy. Mm -hmm. Is it is that is is that what being human is? Is it, Mikey? Is it? And also, going back to this point of like, you know, if, if people are watching you, this in the future, people, would you consider 2024 generation, people who are alive, <laughs> were alive, uh, a happy generation? Is it really bad in the future? And also, uh, which emoji would you be, Mike? Okay, people, this, this is where we came up with the idea of the human flag. This is where we came up with. Oh, yeah, we, this is where we came up with the idea of the human flag, and and it's going to be uh, a smiley emoji. And I will answer your question <laughs> in that it's the 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 smile is a greeting. It's like saying yes, human to human, yes, I see you. Okay, we've got one better than that. One better, which I think some people, the environmental community, appreciate. It's just the Earth. Like it's a, a photograph of the Earth taken from a distance, because basically humans, you know, we're we're kind of bastards. A lot of us, right? So it's like we're destroying the the environment. The climate is going to hell because of us. We're, you know, we're terrible people. But like the Earth itself, that should be the thing we could all get behind, right? 
But, but considering that kind of, you know, the climate is going pretty badly wrong and so is planet Earth, is that going to be a bit of a nostalgic flag? I mean... For the future, they'll be like... Yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, wow, look, there's blue yeah. and there's green and there's like, there's an atmosphere. There's like a little bit of clouds. It's so like, what would it be in 20 years' time? It's, it's going to look like, wa like, wa like WALL-E, the WALL-E movie. That's the what it's going to look like. Okay. Yeah, you know, where it's like environmental. That's, that, that is exactly, that's the WALL-E. That's his yeah. girlfriend, right? He, I mean, he, looks pretty, um, he, he, he was jonesing for an upgrade. <laughs> well, that's very true. I'm not sure how he did either, but like, she had a high pitched, I don't know, digital voice. I mean, what, I don't makes, know, what, what makes this robot come across female? Uh, this is something that we could talk about. We could talk about uh, what's going to happen to uh, to planet Earth uh, in 20 years' time. Is it just going to look not as happy? Uh, I'll come to you then. I just want to talk about this because you mentioned the film Wally, and I'm actually, you know, I think a lot of people here are informed by sci-fi films. Like somebody earlier on was talking about the film Children of Men, which to me well, yes. is an excellent film, which basically w was it was made in like the noughties, but it looks like the UK in 2024, basically. It looks pretty similar to what the uh, UK is like now. So it was very predictive. Um, and Wally, I think, you know, all of these films are just, you know, I think are quite a big kind of part of our imagination of what the future is like. I mean, how many more years before we live in uh, on the film set of Wally? <laughs> uh, probably, yeah, probably, um, it, yeah, another 20 years, I would say. 20 years, and we're going to be in Wally Land. What do you think? They're going to, yeah, they're all going to be watching us on those screens. Remember when they're in the big spaceship and they're flying away, and there are all these enormous people, and they have the screens. They have something like this, not saying one way or another, just saying, but something like this. And they're, but they have the screens in front of them. And they have their their big, you know, 32 ounce whatever they're drinking, and they're just sort of waddling along, right? That, the, those are the people who are looking at us and like, wow, these people, they can stand up, they can walk around. <laughs> they, they have a relatively normal weight to them. That's, um, that's impressive. Yeah. Okay, I mean, is, is that something that worries you, that we're going to be living in a Wally land? You don't have to answer this question. But yeah, yeah, well, I, I feel like it's uh, all this reflection is very human-centered, where we're only a part of a bigger ecos ecosystem, and so I potentially we will just disappear or phase out or be, get smaller population at some point will going to be irrelevant we're like everything we're going to get extinct extinct at some point and uh, not even I feel like it's 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 just how it's supposed to be St stuff end like everything ends uh, at some point our Sun will extinguish the universe will uh, expand to uh, to uh, absence of energy stuff like that so <coughs> There will be something. We just—it's impossible to imagine because there will we will be replaced by other stuff that we cannot imagine. Like the the there were so many uh, extinction events in the history of the of the Earth and life itself. It's difficult to uh, to imagine. But like I feel like Earth will go by without us in a different form. Okay. I mean, what excites you more? A thought of uh, non not existing or maybe existing in a different form in the future? Uh, Richard, what excites you more? <laughs> what excites me more? Um, or none of the above, that's also an option. Again, the optimal blend of friction and duplication. But I mean, in, in, a, in an advanced like Iron Man, Iron Man suit where I'm just flying around the world and you know everybody else is gone, that's kind of lonely, right? I don't want to be inside a tin can when nobody's left. So I'd like to think, you know, more or less we're the, the same, mm -hmm. but... Okay, so as long as the uh, Earth is not a, a lonely place, it should be okay. Since the advent of recording technology, our brains have become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But the technology has increased, so we've kind of transferred... This is, yeah, well, I actually had, did have a brain scan fairly recently, and I was very disappointed to, to find my brain was completely normal. Um, and I was like, isn't this, this isn't like a, an amazing brain? They're like, no, it's completely normal. We're very pleased about it. I mean, 
I mean, we need some speakers. We need some talkers. We don't. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, we have them. This is. Right th these are. These are it. Um, but yeah, people can't hear. You know, maybe this is the exclusive corner. Maybe we got cornered into some kind of like uh, uh, exclusivity. Yeah. Exclusivity as punishment. Um, yeah. We're going to reach sooner or later. We're going to reach the singularity, okay. where everybody, everyone will come and share their thoughts. So we're just warming up. We're just warming up at the moment. We'll, 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 we'll reach the Tolkienoki singularity. Yeah. yeah. We'll reach the Tolkienoki uh, singularity someday. Yeah, but what would that look like? Like, what is singularity in the sense of a talk show? I don't think I've ever asked that question or considered it. But you, you yeah. would be outside of the table. You would be inside the table and outside of it at the same time. Okay. How do you feel about that, Richard? No, you'd be you sitting on the outside, but you'd feel like you're inside and outside at the same time. Yeah, no, I was going to say there'd be a bot in the middle asking questions of the humans, trying to understand us better, so they could take us over more easily. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Understand uh, our weaknesses, you know, our challenges. And I then mean, is is the world of singularity a lonely world, or is it actually it's good because you get a, a multiple perspective of different things? I mean, we're we're already there. The the the. The bots have taken us over. We have to keep looking at our phones. We're a slave to our phones. We, you know, it's the dopamine, dopamine hit coming every, you know, as many as. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so we're kind of there. We're we're kind of there. Yeah. I mean, you just got outraged there. What was it? Was it was it acting? Was it, was it performance skills that we witnessed there, or were you outraged? Performance, yeah, because it was too soon to pull up the game I was looking for. But I think the Phillies lost anyway. Oh, the Phillies, you know, they played in, in over the weekend. The Phillies and the Mets played in London, so I was in London a couple of days ago. And we were in London a couple of weeks ago, but we no, were not aware. Days ago, okay. just over the weekend. We we were in London American yesterday. Played, yeah, it was played in London Stadium. Okay. I mean, could, I'm, I had no idea. We, I, I had no idea. Maybe these people here did. Maybe. I knew about it through social mess social media messaging. Yeah. I knew about it, but I paid no attention to it. I have to say. Okay. Maybe so. I, I, yeah. I don't. I yeah. I can't. I can't judge you, but sure. I mean, judgment is one of the things we can talk about. We can talk about sports. We can talk about singularity. We can talk about loneliness. We can talk about anything you want. Well, what is the singularity for Tokyo? I think it's where individual people no longer, the boundaries between individual people are no longer uh, a, sort of ascertainable because the the kind of thought is just coming from the table, coming from around, and people's thoughts are merging into one. Singularity of thought. So, is the table kind of, is the table itself producing the thoughts? Is it people kind of, you know, the table's been around for long enough to absorb? And I think the singularity is where you no longer know, just thoughts are being produced from the collective. No, I think that's what, what is yeah. it? killed my job there. I don't know what I'm thinking anymore. No, I mean, so I worked at Google for many years, and they internally, there were people who were very interested in this. I know, sorry, I apologize oh. profusely. But, um, People who are very focused on the singularity. And it was that. It was like when human beings and machines were so merged, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. And I think, among other things, that means thoughts, feigned emotions, whatever, are coming from everywhere. You don't know where they're actually originating or, or what it actually means. But can, but can you give me an example of that? Because, like, conceptually, I understand it. But at what point in my day could I be feeling this? What, in what kind of circumstances? Is well, it possible now or in the future? No, we're seeing this now. There, whatever percentage of the of the voices on the internet are bots. They're not human beings. So when you go to TikTok, go to Meta, you go to Instagram, you go to wherever. There are all these people out there, and they're having these conversations, and a lot of times it's very heightened emotion because it drives engagement, which makes money for the big platforms. But it's you don't even know who's a human being anymore. It's very hard to tell. And you go to LinkedIn, apparently 20% of the profiles are not humans. They're just created by vast farms of people who want to go out there and take data. So we're moving in that direction already, and we're already having difficulty discerning who's a human being and who's not. Okay, I mean. Take that time capsule. Yeah, take yeah. Take that. <laughs> Google, Google yeah, talk. Google that. But I mean, is singularity good for business <laughs> then, or 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 not? Like, is is singularity, um, yeah, good way of? <laughs> yeah, is it good for business? Uh, look, I. So I'm writing a book. It's coming out this fall. It's called Reweaving the Web. Richard Witt. Pick it up on Amazon. 
No, not Amazon. <laughs> Wherever. <laughs> but. Oh, Amazon, not now. Come I, it's a bad joke. But on the back, we're actually joking about the back's going to say 100% human content. Okay. Right? Chat GPT was not consulted or utilized in any of the content of this book. And are you are you completely as a as a good thing? No, sorry. No, 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 that's fine. I mean, like, uh, first of all, congratulations on releasing a book or publishing the book, sh shall I say? Um, so well done, well done. Um, Jimmy Fallon and I will be like this in you yeah. know in October. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so make sure that you uh, send us a copy to review or discuss uh, on the toolkit table. Um, yeah, but how, I mean, but you say that there was no um, Chat GPT used in uh, in writing the book but are your thoughts your own thoughts great question because i obviously i google searched a bunch of things you know historical facts quotations so I relied on google to assume they're giving me the real thing but obviously it's an algorithm pulling information from various sources where's the algorithm begin and end there uh, i mean are you referencing that in your book at all like this is this is what i'm writing this is the context i'm committing to in order to illustrate something but actually I got it from a Google search and could actually be wrong or biased or whatever. Or is that going too deep? God damn it, you just fucked my sales. No. Um, <laughs> okay, no. scrap that. There's no book coming out. As a <laughs> no, I don't, I don't reference that. But, but I talk about some other elements of, of this sort of this aspect of human and machine coming together over time. And that we are increasingly not going to know the difference. And we may not care. Me totally fine. Maybe it's a good world to live in. Well, this is it. I mean, to what extent do we actually care for, you know, the sources of where our thoughts come from, the, the ideas come from? Does it actually matter? Uh, at some point, maybe it, it, it's just too deep to, to unpick. There's a very good French film that I can't remember the name of, and it's about this people living in a rural part of France, and one of the characters is a farmer who's gone online. Not it's not a data farm. His data is being farmed because he, end, he sort of thinks he's chatting up this girl, but it's actually a teenager in Senegal that's trying to scam him. And the whole film kind of un, unravels, but in... I'm going to tell you the end of the film because you're never going to see it because it's very obscure. In the end, he goes, he tracks down this teenager in Senegal and first of all he says he wants his money back but then he, what happens is he gets lonely. He gets lonely because he, um, he wants, he misses this interaction that he has with the pretend sexy girl that the teen, the the teenage boy was pretending to be, so he sort of asked him to start it back up again. Oh, okay, so they continue their... They can t even though he knows it's fake, even, <laughs> even though he knows it's fake, he just, like, he, he needs to just, he needs it too much, he's too addicted. So, I mean, are we too addicted to, uh, to fake human interactions? I mean, have, has anybody ever developed a, 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 a relationship with on, an online presence in some way, shape or form? I, I know, I haven't had this experience. There was... Are you online? Sorry? Are you online? Uh, yeah, just in general, are you online? Are you, yeah? I mean, how do you find being online? Come and join us, this is a talk show. Give us two minutes of your time. Are you, are you making notes with a piece of paper and a pen? I'm really impressed. That's okay, that's okay, he's writing a story. Maybe it's a new book. But anyway, we're here, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, I, I think it was the... the um, well, it was uh, for in the family of my girlfriend from back then. And the guy had a, was a fan of Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez, which is a Disney Channel uh, sing, sing, singer, uh, pop star, anyways. And... He was convinced he had uh, he had a f deep friendship with her, which was not th uh, not actually the case. Maybe you want to interject, no? Uh, and uh, act because most like yeah, he, he he would chat with her on a regular on a regular basis, but like uh, through Facebook, and it was the official page. But like what was evident, it was like uh, some somebody else, not her. Hello, sir. Come and join us. Do you know who Selena Gomez is? Do you want to find out? Are you on the phone to her right now? No, no, I'm phoning someone else. Okay, well, you can phone him from here. We're just talking about uh, Selena Gomez. And so, yeah, he was, he was convinced. 
relationship. Yeah, it's what we call a parasocial relationship, but even fake because it obviously wasn't her. She's an American. She has hundreds of thousands of fans, and uh, he was really taken advantage of because he was uh, like a really de uh, kind of addicted to this interaction. But he was a very lonely guy, uh, a sad, uh, sad person. So I feel like there's there's a the thing the people who will get taken advantage of are the people already suffering from loneliness which whichever the source of this loneliness can be okay so people are already suffering from loneliness really important comment it's raining out there god damn it um yeah um yeah so it's interesting sam altman his one of his favorite movies is her which is the movie that scarlett johansson sam altman who is the ceo of open ai um, and he thinks it's a great movie. Ironically, I think it's Spike Lee, it's a dystopia, right? This guy, Theodore Twombly, falls in love with the Scarlett Johansson character, who is a bot on his phone, who has 8,000 other men who have also fallen in love with her, more or less simultaneously, that she's managing all this, right? He doesn't know that. All he knows is it's on the phone. He takes her on dates. He shows her around on his phone. It's, like, amazing. You have people there. Oh, he wants... Yeah. So, anyway, I'm just saying... So there, that is a, a really so a fascinating, it's a dystopia to most of us, but to Sam Altman, that's the future he wants to see in the world. I mean, is there something wrong with that? I mean, one of the interesting things about that film is she doesn't lie to him when, when, he she, when, yeah, when he finally gets around to asking her, are you chatting to other people? She says, yeah, currently I'm talking to 42,700 people right this uh, this second, so, but he in the, and I think this is the thing is that we there's a part of us that wants to be in that space that wants that doesn't want to know the reality but actually just wants that you know what you called it earlier on the dopamine hit or just you know or whatever it is the love that can be given by the operating system. I mean, and, so it, and it's not necessarily deception. But if it is, we, it's us deceiving ourselves. I mean, but, but is the future of relationships uh, open AI relationships? Is that where it's all going? <laughs> See what I did there? See what I did there? Yeah. Come on, hit it. Yeah, yeah. Hit it. Thank you, Mikey. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> just got it. That's okay. No, no, I got it. Yeah, yeah, it's not that funny. Um, I, yes, I do. I think I think our relationships today are mediated between human and human, but we already use technology. We use we, we text back and forth to each other. Texts become their own form of communication. Now the text is going to tell me, oh, you should say this rather than that, because the AI is trying to inform me what's the best way to speak to this person, knowing them. And so on and on and on. So at some point, when does the conversation become, I just sit there and my bot is just doing all the work for me. And my wife's like, oh, what's going on there? Or, you know, whoever it is. Um, so I, I think it's going to be this really bizarre mediated world where we are less and less in charge. Okay, we're going to be living in a more mediated world. Uh, Mike, I mean, what is your world right now? Is it heavily mediated or have you got like some kind of a cap on it? Well, I'm just quite old school. I don't have very many apps on my phone and I don't actually know how to Abs use them. No. Apps. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> abs over apps. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. But um, it's just like. <laughs> I mean, I do. I, I, do I, get I get annoyed actually sometimes when my phone suggests a way of talking that I'm thinking something differently. But like how? When? Like it just. It's just minor at the moment. So it will say, if you say sorry, I'm, then it will say running late for dinner, you know, or something like that. Yeah, it's predictive text, but obviously that is the beginning of what is a large language model where you're actually, and so, yeah, yeah, well, it would, that's the thing, it would be the exact opposite, it, the, in the end, the AI would be there to sort of, as you say, mediate and, and, and tactfully say whatever, I got held up, at, it wouldn't say I'm shouting a lady behind the bar, it would say I got held up at the bar, in a deep conversation, so I'll be home later. And then, you know, it's me. It's saying it in exactly the right way, that because it knows both parties, it knows how to smooth this out. So it's gonna, we're gonna end up being dependent on the AI, AI for the ta for saying it better for the tact, you know, for the for the diplomacy, for the you know, for the smoothness of the conversation. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I mean, is, is there a world or is there a context where that would be quite useful? I mean, you know, if you're keeping your partner happy by saying the right things, even on text or whatever, is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how often do people listen to their mates anyway? I mean, to be honest, right? Mates. Yes. <laughs> There's a great MASH episode where this guy says, I want to like, I, I go to Tokyo. Why do I go to Tokyo? Why don't I meet a woman that I can think about years from now while, while my wife is talking to me, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's a laugh line. Most guys are like, oh, most of them are like, oh, well, fuck you, whatever. But, you know, that's, that's the thing. People often do not hear each other, in, particularly in deep ways. Maybe this mediation sort of handles the shallow parts. Oh, you handle that stuff because I'm off watching something at the pub or whatever. So... So maybe it becomes an accommodation that actually works. Mm. So maybe it's a lifeline for some relationships or something like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like uh, feel like proper communication or good communication is a skill, and and in inter interpersonal relationships. And I feel like nobody has no not all everybody has that skill. And so some people, for some people, maybe it's not a skill they're willing to work for. And so they rather have it mediated by something else, uh, for example. Uh, I mean, think about, um, uh, think about all the time that you would gain if you just cut out all this meaningful, deep, considered con you know, conversation skills. I mean, you could do so much more with your time. Like that's a, that's a, I, f I find deep deep personal interaction discussions and uh, having uh, complicated uh, conversations about the m the meta level of how I uh, relate to people very interesting actually like how how do we talk about the, how we relate how do we talk about how we communicate how do we talk about what what uh, we like or don't like in the other person's way of communicating with i find this fascinating mm -hmm. i i li like that's one of the thing i i talk the most about one of my partners is how communication actually it's about the uh, the meta level uh, meta discussions about our relationships Maybe that's just the, that's the human to human. I'm just talking about like the text or the email or the all the digital mediation, quote unquote, yeah, right? I know it can be very dry. For example, right? I know, very like dry by, I, I know through messages I can be very dry because I, I, I text kind of like I, sp I would speak, but without the nonverbal, and so that it cuts out the, the thing. And so we, I, I, sometimes I read back my text, it's like, oh, that was dry. <laughs> or I go the other way, and it's I spend uh, half an hour uh, crafting fine. very complicated messages, but so I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it, only if it's important, to, I'm sure that the person gets the nuances of what I'm trying to say without any uh, possibility of... Mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, it sounds okay. like you would it's be a. It. I think it. it sounds to me like you would be a perfect kind of I don't know AI trainer uh, for Meta and for yes. stuff like that. I mean, you're really into language. Yeah, obviously, you're very self-aware. Uh, have you ever considered Ruth career in Meta and, and, and stuff like that? Mike, yeah, what I don't like is when people send me voice notes. I really hate it. Why? Sometimes I don't listen to them for like three days. Why? Because I I don't know. Yeah, like a sort of like, oh, hi, Mikey, I was going to call you or text you, but I'm just going to leave this long rambling message. It's not really about anything. <laughs> and, and at some point, I'm going to get to the actual point that I was going to make. But I know that you've, like, you've turned off your music now and you've like, stopped, especially just to hear this message. So I'm going to tell you what I... Oh, oh, actually, I'll call you back. And that's like, just like... I just, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you have these voice notes from animals, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, I was trying to have a snooze button. But That's to me. No, no, but it's really because... Is that a problem? Well, I actually know a fair number of people, mostly on the younger side, who do not want to talk on the phone. They just want to email or they want to leave a message. I don't want... It's, like, the worst thing is to call somebody and they pick up. Oh, fuck, I gotta talk to them for 20 minutes? Oh, jeez, I just want to leave them a two-minute message. I'll meet you wherever next week when we're done. I mean, what? I mean, I'm just interested in like kind of you know amateur psychology behind that. Like, what is the worst that can happen if somebody say I call somebody and they pick up? Like, what what are the fears? I mean, is anybody here a trained psychologist? Just checking. No. Okay. Do you have any views anyway? <laughs> no, but like what what I find annoying with um, vocal messages though is that if there are important information, then it cannot cannot be checked quickly, and that's annoying when people. Like, 
For example, uh, ah, uh, uh, rendezvous uh, this place at that hour, and uh, the, the next day I forgot where what the exact hour was, and I have to re uh, re uh, browse a, a, f a five minute message to have this precise information. That's um, that's the kind of stuff that annoys me. That like when you, when it's important information. Uh, it's, written, it's 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 better written because it's more accessible to to especially since I'm very distracted and so I, I need to g <laughs> be able to go back go check it back r later <laughs> easily. If somebody tries to meet you over a voice note, you're not coming. Basically, you uh, won't no, be no, there. No, it's not that. But like, I'd be very annoyed that uh, they. What the fuck? Why don't you write me a message with information? I mean, I, I just want to ask you, though, Hish, uh, as you had the microphone, but now I have it, uh, but I'll ask you anyway. Um, are you scared to pick up calls when, when there's a no number or someone that you know, or, or somebody says, like, hey, can you call this person at work? No, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm an easy caller. I, it, I find it easier to call than to write an email, because an email I have to formulate very precisely how I word it so that uh, the, by text it won't be, be get misinterpreted and stuff like that. I, I don't, I don't want an AI to do this job for me. I don't, don't care about it. Yeah. But like, um, but like, I know by by in person or by voice, I know how to formulate myself clearly enough to get across my message. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a fear of that. I'm very extroverted, I, so I don't have a, a, any issue calling people. Yeah, that's a, that comes as a, as, a, as, a, as a big... Uh, as a yellow shirt? What's the kind of... The <laughs> anyway, I, I had a sound effect for it, but I don't know where it is. Uh, Mikey, are you scared of phone calls? Sometimes I get a little... I don't, I'm not that I don't do it, because actually, being a, coming from the genre of live art, actually sort of like to face my fears. So I am, I am scared, but I do it anyway. I mean, do you feel like the, um, it, the live art, whatever that is, uh, has prepared you to be, I don't know, more interactive, more kind of public facing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was actually a very shy person. I used to get like a real adrenaline rush whenever I phoned anybody that I didn't know. Mm. Now that's diminished a little bit, but I would still get a little bit, a little bit, yeah. I still get a little bit actually nervous, but in a nervous in a good way mm -hmm. when I call people. In a kind of alive, live Yeah, like, I'm alive, I'm doing something real. I'm calling a real person. This is what yeah. life is about. Yeah. I'm speaking to someone and there's no script. Yeah. That's right. So you get your adrenaline uh, uh, rush from, from the phone or from phoning someone. I mean, Richard, where on the kind of introvert, extrovert scale are you? I am a uh, socially amenable introvert. I tend, well, I tend to I draw my energy from from myself as opposed to being around other people. Mm -hmm. But I like other people. I like being with them. I just I can't be with them 24 by 7. Is it so like 8 o'clock at night? I'm like, oh god, I gotta go home because I just gotta like get back to myself and mm -hmm. read a book and you know be boring or whatever. A little bit of meditation. Yeah, I do meditation. You know, uh, yoga. X for some battery. Yeah. Okay. okay. That works too. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you are? I, I think so. Yeah. It's uh, so I need uh, social contact and the physical, like in presence. I need it, but at some point I need to have alone time because otherwise I'm, I need the two. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, that's why. Uh, that's why. Uh, like for ev for example, the the lockdown really fucked me up. Yeah. But like uh, at the same time, there are p moments I, I shut myself in and I don't see anybody, and I need it kind of. So it's actually the two. So I'm just interested in like what is the was the uh, obviously as a, as a host in the middle, I have no views, thoughts, or opinions. I'm merely passing on the microphone, and anything that I think or you know. I, I will turn into a question, um, but so, so I would, for instance, I could say like, so why do we need people in interactions anyway? Like, are the, do we just need an audience for ourselves? Is that the value of being with people? Like, what is that? No, there's just there's just an aspect of being among others. Like, I mean, a classic case is you go to a coffee shop to work. You have your laptop, you're working, but you're around other people. You could do that at home in the living room, but you like the fact that you're in a social environment. Maybe you see somebody you know, or you meet somebody you didn't know, 
just you know talk to the barista. There's there's an aspect of being social that I think is important. Now, some people may not agree, but that's I mean it's sort of like that that balance. I mean, do you get any work done when you're working on your laptop from the cafe and talking to the barista and other things? Yes. Well, my book Reweaving the Web is coming out September 1st uh, on Amazon. <laughs> Fourteen ninety-five. Audiobook to be penned shortly. Uh. Thank you for letting us know. So we need to read the book to actually find out uh, the answers. Yes, page three twenty-seven, and it's all there. Okay. Uh, pure human c uh, context. No, no, no. Uh, content. Sorry, sorry. I do think it's good to have an audio book as well because I recently had some eyesight problems and it meant that for a while I couldn't actually read. And yeah, and I, I really the kind what you can get on audio book is quite limited compared Where to the were books. Where you getting your audio books from? Just from well, I wasn't getting them at all because I didn't have, have any of the books. But Audible was what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had a question. Yeah, so my editor, we're, we're going to do an audio book for sure. And I'm sort of like you know I'm American. Maybe I should have an in English accent. Right? Yep. To do it. It sounds more authoritative to Americans because Americans are not very smart, just to be clear. Um, but, but the other question is like, it's always men. And I asked her, like, what about a woman? I could have a woman. Oh, no, no. Women's voices tend to be perceived as shrill. And like, they just they don't work well with audiobooks. It's mostly men. I'm like, wow, I never really thought about that. So, didn't know if anybody had a thought about that. So, when you finally get an audio version of your book, let me know. We'll check if my voice is too shrill. Um. Sorry, what was that? What was that? I just, uh, it's a bit too high frequency for me. Sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Is it like a dolphin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I do think it is true. Like most audiobooks you get, I, I mean, I, I can't, I think I might have heard like two audiobooks in my life that have been read by women. So they're very, very rare. Oh, are they Pride and Prejudice or something? Probably something like that. But it's it is you know I mean but you I think once again you're kind of pandering to uh, an expectation you know I, I think somebody's got to change that mold someone's got to change the narrative and do it differently I mean I, I there's a there's a couple of um, there's this it is a guy but it's a it's they've got quite an effeminate voice and it's kind of like vocally androgynous. Uh, it's a person that does um, uh, this podcast that you, on YouTube that I watch called, uh, I can't remember what it's called, something like Ocean Deep, or it's about deep ocean discovery or something like that. And I like that voice because it's kind of, <laughs> and I think a voice like that would be really good to do it, to narrate a book, like a, like a vocally androgynous voice. Okay, so, um, I mean, as a, as a host in the middle, I would sometimes attempt uh, linking different uh, subjects together. We're talking about vo vocal power, we're talking about deep frying before. I mean, where does vocal fry uh, <laughs> uh, sit on the scale of, um, I don't know, li audibility, listenability? Uh, it's just a question that obviously nobody asked for, um, and no one's going to answer. Yeah. Well, I just want to say about, you know, in the UK we've got the received pronunciation, which is, you know, like the BBC kind of their, it does evolve, but their idea of what is a clear, vo and it's invented for understandability, that's what they say, but obviously there's a kind of class connotation for that, and that, you know, it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a snooty kind of sound, even though that the, the kind of, their thought about how they've come up with it is all about just listenability, but there, you can't separate these things out. I mean, can I ask about like other countries around the world? I think you mentioned Belgium. You're yeah. from Belgium. Uh, I mean, is there something you know? Can the way you speak, your accent, your tone of voice uh, yeah. show your class? And yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, plus, uh, I'm I'm a French speaker. Uh, and so uh, there's a huge stuff around accents and uh, especially regards to France well, if you speak there was uh, there used to be a very uh, a lot of uh, uh, French making fun of Belgian people and identifying notably because of their accent and there's a lot of Belgian jokes in French which are uh, taking Belgians for uh, like, making so <laughs> there's a bad of the joke. Usually they're they're stupid and so, something like that. And uh, like even inside Belgium, there are different. Uh, you have a Wallonia, 
which is the French speaking part, and you have different accents, different uh, depending on the, the the region. And there's the stuff of uh, accents. For example, uh, if you're a journalist in Belgium, if you have a thick accent, you you're less likely to end up with uh, speaking uh, roles because like it's more neutral, uh, or it makes it's it's less professional, which is uh, uh, it's, it's supposed to be less professional, which is classist actually because uh, like it's because you sound poorer kind of so uh it's, so they or, or even in france like the, the the you're supposed not to have an accent uh not maybe to be less regionalist but also because it may, makes less uh, it sounds less poor i guess because okay, so and there are specific accents that are more made fun of or more identified for uh, the accent of an idiot. For example, the accent from Picardy, Picardy which is the north of France, ah, close to Belgium, oh, what a, what a coincidence, oh. um, where there used to be a lot of miners. Now, of course, they got very, uh, they were poor people, now the mining is defunct, so everybody there is struggling for, uh, uh, on the class le financial level for generations, and so it's even more identified as, uh, as uh, like a uh, uh, r r the rednecks of uh, of France, something like that. So, yeah, of course, there's class class problems involved. I mean, uh, so w will you be mining for different accents when you get your thank you uh, when you get your book published? Absolutely, I think I think Belgian would be top of my list. I, I'm I'm mostly familiar with Belgium from Monty Python episodes. And there was one that was called Prejudice, and they said let's talk about the Belgians, and they had a couple of like bad jokes, like let's not talk about the Belgians, let's ignore them, you know. And like what's the best word for Belgian? And it's like stinking fat Belgian bastards, and then you know, and people laugh, whatever. And it's like the, we can't think of a worse we can't think of a worse word than Belgian, right? So it's like it, you know it is. I intend to be this totally over the top, totally prejudicial, but a little funny, right? Because I mean they're poking a little fun, but um, yeah. Yeah, but like. So, so Belgium is going to be top of your list when it comes to turning your book, which is coming out 27th of I September. Want, I want some miners. It's reweaving the web. I'm not sure that comes out. Reweaving. So. In a Belgian accent, okay. but I want the miner. I want the miners doing okay, it. Yeah, I want yeah, someone okay, who. But do you want to say it in uh, uh, French? No, no, no. Uh, I'll say it in English, but with a French accent from a Belgian guy. Okay, so do a pitch for the book, but. Ah, the pitch. Okay. Wow. Uh, Reliving the web. Alors, uh, it would be a book uh, with uh, the t talking about uh, the uh, how to how to reweave the web. It was uh, like a tapestry, but uh, uh, the 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 strands are us. And maybe the AIs. Uh, so I don't know. I don't. I don't know. You know. Available for only one ninety nine from for Amazon. Five hours. <laughs> yeah, five for five hours. hours. <laughs> really did he? Did did he get the job? Oh, he nailed it! Oh my god! Amazing. <laughs> so um, yeah. So uh, I'll let you guys discuss the the terms and conditions later. But I mean, I mean, <laughs> what direction do you want to take uh, this conversation and this direction to? Um, materialize, the, exchange the final tokens for some more non-alcoholic beers. Is that the direction you'd like to take it? I feel like we, and you know, I'm very much enjoyed both of you, Richard, his, your contributions, You've done a great job in the middle, but I am hungry for fresh blood, fresh blood, <laughs> fresh blood for this conversation, just to get a different, fresh food, like fresh food as well. Well, I mean, yeah. we didn't get any free food, oh, yeah, hour, yeah. 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 I, I feel like we've been advertised to, but given nothing. I mean, what's the future of food? Is it going to be downloadable food? Or like what? Oh yeah, like in Star Trek, you know, where you have like the, the replicator and it comes out and it's like perfectly made, but it's all synthetic. Oh. That's our Star Trek button. So I mean, in terms of like fresh blood, do we need to go and... Um, Maybe do we need to replace the 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 break the break? Yeah. <laughs> do you need to have brakes on this? Um, yeah, Mikey. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe it's time for just a little break, and maybe we just need to sort of handcuff some people to the table. There are people out there. I can see them. They're all there. People, come to Tokyoki. Yeah. And they've got, yeah, these people, there. there's a lot of people there that are Tokyoki addicts, but we just failed to, we're just too too much in the corner. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly, exactly. But maybe it's time to get some final thoughts for this session. Okay, well, 
Listen, guys, let's just get some final uh, thoughts uh, from you. We have been talking about, uh, we started off talking about food, talking about the future of relationships, talking about communication, talking about Meta and Google. Obviously, we talked about your book at length. We talked about the sound of people's voices, machine voices, and what kind of message that sends out. Is it, you know, is it some kind of signifier of class? Uh, and other things also we talked about. We talked about Wally. Uh, and are we living in Wally now or is it just 20 years away as Mikey predicts? So let's take some final thoughts. Uh, come and join us if you'd like to. We're talking about are we living in the future now? We won't, but I'm just going to make this up. Uh, come and join us. This is Tokioki. We've got Richard, we've got Ish, we've got Mikey. My name is Margo. And come on in, uh, tell us your names. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome. What's your name? Pleasure to meet you. Chaylin, pleasure to meet you. Uh, and what's your name? Michelle. Michelle, Chaylin, um, Richard Ish, and Mikey, and I'm Margo. And this is Tokiki. So, the way this works, this is a talk show. You guys decide on the direction of the conversation. We talk about lots of different things. Mikey, what should we be talking about? And that's a question to everyone. No, well, it's just, I mean, it's not really a topic, but the way you said it, it sounded like Richard Ish, but it's Richard Ish. Richard Ish and Isham. So I just want to point out, it's two, it's two different people, two different people. Yeah. So have I just, so have I just introduced singularity into the Tokyo table? We have been talking about singularity. Do you know what singularity is? Oh God, uh, singularity. <laughs> Take your time. Everything converges into one thing. Yep. And then maybe it blows up, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, okay, yeah, I think you, you got it right there. I mean, singularity, how does that make you feel? Michelle, are you feeling good about it? Are you terrified? Very scary. <laughs> okay, why? Um, well, I'm just afraid of um, what artificial super intelligence can, can do, um, how it's going to take over our economy, our li lives, etc. So, just lots of unknowns. Okay. Are you here at MozFest to kind of uh, re reaffirm your fears? Or are you here to get some tips to maybe change it, shape it in a positive way? I'm open to all of them. Um, I'm a student. Well, I'm graduating this month, so I'm just here to learn from people, meet people who are working in the space. Thank you. <laughs> what did you graduate from, or will you be graduating from? Um, I'm at Sciences Po in Paris right now, and I'm studying uh, for a master's in public affairs. Okay, yeah. public affairs. Uh, we have covered some public affairs earlier, but I mean, is is AI a big concern in your line of uh, research? And uh, Mikey, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we go around and talk AI a lot, and it depends who you ask. What you know, you come to Mozfest, it's like, oh, AI, and they, it's this button gets pressed a lot. But when we go to the genomics people, the genetics people, they're like. AI, they are pressing this button, like this. and they're like, "Oh, AI solved this problem. It solved that problem. You know, we now got this incredibly complex model of a tumor that we couldn't have done without AI." And there's lots of fields in which AI is solving problems, and I think, by and large, it's only when you come to people that are kind of, you know, almost like. The, the sort of visionaries of the internet that actually kind of see that dystopian side. I, I don't think it really exists much in, the, let's say, the professional community outside of, you know, the people like here in, in MozFest. So, I mean, are MozFest people just a little bit of like dark vision, visionaries? Visionaries? No, it's a different kind of job. Are they, I mean, are you, um, are you feeling bleak about the future, Chalen? Uh, I'm I'm feeling really positive about the future. Are you from the genomics field? Uh, I am not from the genomics field, um, but I just like to feel positive about everything, um, if I can, because otherwise, uh, why would I be living and trying to improve things if I thought that it was totally doomed? Okay. I mean, I've got this mind experiment. Can we just give maybe uh, Chaylin a challenge? So give some kind of scenario of something that is like quite worrying, and maybe you can put a positive spin on it. Is anybody worried about anything in terms of uh, anything? Mikey? Well, I'm I'm certainly worried about the gamification of uh, po politics, the way that bots are taking over, and uh, kind of creating creating false kind of uh, information, but also kind of you know like twisting 
everything into it and this kind of confirmation bias, the silo effect and the, the kind of polarization of society which we see all around the world in Europe and in the US and in the UK and probably other countries too. I mean, Chairman, would you like to take this challenge and kind of riff <laughs> of the positives of well, this is silofication, or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just the way that people are. Yeah, I mean, it's the silos are good. They're full of yeah. grain. Yeah. The silos are full of grain. They feed people. Yeah, you're not Chalen, though. <laughs> okay, so uh, people being chatted to by chatbots and the kind of people living in silos and gamification of. Politics. The politics. Uh, sure. So, so speaking of silos, speaking of games, let's talk about uh, sports teams. Yep. You know, I, I'm not a big sports guy, but you have people who are like, "Hey, this team is my identity," and like they that really uh, gets them engaged in like a social group. Mm -hmm. So maybe when people are finding their political team, it's like, uh, I mean, of course, a negative. It's reaffirming beliefs, but maybe those beliefs were already existing. Um, like part of this silo effect is because we have tools like. The the internet so you're actually able to reach out find a lot of people with like similar ideas uh, I think a lot of us are like nerds and so uh, when we were young like we felt maybe very isolated of like uh, oh like uh, no one at my school is into like painting small miniatures you know but then you go oh my god you will not believe this but we had this very conversation maybe I'll cycle back to two hours ago somebody Unnamed mentioned painting little figurines. So yeah, thank you. As much as yeah. what energizes you. Yeah, what it energizes you? So yeah. So you're saying turn <laughs> nerdiness and geekery into a sport. Well, what I'm more saying is that when you have these sort of like niche interests, whether these are like a fun thing or a like scary political thing, I guess like with tools like the internet with like new technology you can actually find community around that and you can meet people make friends okay so uh joining a, a right-wing online platform can be actually good for your mental health and your social life right is, does that convince you okay but what i want to say that's like internet and ai are tools and like like a hammer a hammer is made it solves a lot of problem you can uh, you can put, put nails inside of stuff you can pull out nails you can uh, you can uh, mash stuff i don't know it's 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 very it's, it solves a lot of problem but you can also, can also kill someone with it so it's a tool it depends how you use it. Uh, the problem is our is the scale, the control, who gets to use it, and the problem is people. Who Hello, come and join us. It's okay. You've done it. It's in such a kind of smooth way. I haven't even noticed you walking. But welcome to Tokyoki. Uh, we've got Mikey. We've got Michelle. We've got Chalen. We've got Richard. We've got Isha. Margaret. What's her name? Kitty. Kitty, welcome. Uh, this is Tokyoki okay, right now. We were talking, we're putting positive spin on things like gamifying the political life. Uh, just trying to put some hope into this otherwise quite a bleak perspective on technology. Yeah, Mikey. Well, recently in the UK, we had this campaign called Be Kind Online, which was supposed to be. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind online anyway, so, but, uh, you know, it worked for me. But the, 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 the point of it was, was trying to get people to interact more responsibly online but there was never a it was a campaign by the BBC which I'm kind of watching and addicted to but it was never a single mention about the engineering of social media platforms or any kind of platforms it was all about personal responsibility to be nice and nothing about the responsibility of, of the platforms to actually you know they talking about tools they're they are kind of making the tools as hazardous as possible rather than as safe as possible and I think that is a gross uh, dereliction of responsibility. Okay. Uh, so I mean um, going back to the kind of public affairs world I mean be kind campaign in public affairs uh, would that work? I think it depends I think I agree with you that um, it really is on on the platforms to um, to kind of, kind of implement policies, but of course they're not going to be naturally incentivized to do so as for profit um, companies. So it's really up to the government, to po policymakers, to set policies to kind of ensure that they do act responsibly. Okay, uh, so maybe there should be like a follow up campaign directed at the policymakers and people who make those tools, kind of like mirror campaign. Just look at yourself. What are you creating? I mean, Kitty, are you are you worried about that at all? 
I'm a little bit jumping into the discussion now, so I'm not quite sure what, what we're talking about, but... <laughs> that, was jumping. Jump. that was a jump. Uh, I think it probably is either way. So one, I am a big proponent of making platforms accountable for what they do and what they uh, provide in terms of, you know, facilitate in terms of uh, communications and, and virtual for people. The other thing is that there is also a responsibility for users. Uh, we have had a, a television program or a radio program it was actually uh, many many years ago when uh, Twitter now X was just uh, announced or uh, introduced and there were a lot of people that were extremely um, vicious in their responses in uh, you know in their comments and they <laughs> actually they try to find these people with uh, public information and they would ring the bell and say hey are you this and this person and did you actually post this this comment and it appeared that these were not extremists these were nurses teachers normal pe people that would have a little bit of a drink and uh, very late at night and they would feel this this whole anonymity thing that <laughs> would yeah, make <laughs> yes I, I had I had three points as well but um uh, they would feel that they were anonymous and they could just spew all kinds of stuff that they were later on when they were confronted with it like appalled mm -hmm. with their own comments so it is also it is sort of yeah so that's something that used to happen or at the beginning of Twitter now yeah, I'm, X. Not sure still, yeah. I'm not sure if it's still the case but that was in the beginning very much that people were just you know they were just swept away mm -hmm. with this whole idea of being able but to also, just but there, also there's this kind of accountability there was some kind of like even I don't know uh, somebody had the idea of going back to actual physical people yes. and following up on their comments you were mentioning about uh, LinkedIn a 20% or something you said are just the bots so I guess it would be more difficult to ring on those doorbells but uh, what are you going to say Richard? right but i think one of the challenges also on, on social media is so much of it is, is anonymous you know or it's not like oh that person at that address with that you know social security number that you know with the wife and the three children or whatever so the the accountability level is very low and so people can almost do or say anything mm -hmm. even beyond the ability for reporters to suss out who some of them were mm -hmm. so i think that really unfortunately feeds into it and you like to think there's a balance cuz anonymity can be a good thing if there's sensitive conversations and people want to be able to talk about situations without necessarily being identified um, but i think that that feeds into some of the unfortunately some of the extreme commentary. Well, I mean, could AI help us tracking those people down, those bots down or whatever? Is that a useful way of addressing? It's just curious. I mean, I wouldn't want, I, I think, when we were talking about this earlier, that AI can actually help with things like tact and diplomacy. You know, so I would employ the AI to actually have a conversation with the people posting hateful things and just try and work out what it's about. Because, as you say, very often it's just about trying to express some kind of rage that they've got on the, you know, they're probably normal people, but also they want to be heard, they want to get response and that's why they're being extreme and the, all social media platforms are encouraging us to, to say more extreme things to get more likes and to get more plaudits and more shares so instead of being you know instead of being consensual and being considerate and that being rewarded which could easily be rewarded engineering wise we are rewarding the, the wrong things and so you know uh, for sure a combination of AI and a different strategy and policy could actually really easily help this problem I think. Mm. Okay. So who, would, who here would kind of uh, get AI to help them work for some kind of communication barriers I don't know just like find the right words to express their extremist views? I mean the challenge is it cuts both ways you could find bots who could do that in a good way if, if the right governance behind them so the right people programming them the right way to push you know the conversations in directions but if they're if they're essentially captive to the current social media environment all they're going to do is want to up you know ramp up the the extremism because it drives sales it drives volume so it's all about the people behind the scenes who are determining how those bots are being used like to. Are you, uh, are you at all? <laughs> you're going to hand your AI? 
And the, the, I, it's, uh, again, it's, I think it's a tool, so depending on who uses it, it can be responsibly or not, and uh, depending on the, uh, their intentions and their goals and motives and stuff like that, so okay. it's a tool. Okay, it's a tool, Kitty? Yeah. yeah. With a lot of power yeah. and Yeah, so it, it's, I, I, I agree it's a tool, but not every tool is neutral, obviously, mm -hmm. but I think what what in the end what lays uh, at the bottom of this is what uh, a wise investor once said is tell me the incentive the business incentive and i'll tell you the results of this of of a development and the business incentive in the ter if, if we talk about social especially social media uh but probably also a big part of generative ai is that um y you want mass a mass you you amass mass <laughs> by uh doing outrageous things because we love outrageous things apparently as humanity so i'm not sure if ai is going to be the right tool in this case to uh to moderate discussion actually i think it's going to be it's going to only you know make it more extreme to be quite honest. I mean, what do you think about this uh, idea? Are we drawn, naturally drawn to outrageous things? I mean, can painting little figurines get out of hand? Uh, are you worried about that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not so worried about that. I do think that we are naturally drawn to outrageous things. Like, I do think that when companies created these algorithms or like if it was, you know, machine learning or something, I don't know the technical side, but it's fed because people continued liking or interacting with that content and so they're going to interact with it more and more. So I don't think it was necessarily in the beginning like, uh, hey, we're gonna hard code this so if you're hateful it gets spread. But at this point, like, it's very clear that hateful content is what's being spread online and so like it's, it's clear that there need to be some steps on top of that. But I do think it is maybe uh, something inherent in human nature mm -hmm. and maybe we could uh, maybe the AI that we have people talk to can prescribe some meditative hobbies mm -hmm. like painting small figurines mm -hmm. uh, maybe if everyone spent a little more time uh, doing doing uh, these these little tasks mm -hmm. instead of commenting online uh, yeah, they might be online. happier yeah. uh, at the same time is that like putting people because we were talking about silos earlier like mm -hmm if we have you just like talking to an AI instead of talking online, are we just putting every single person in their own like individual silo? Mm. Um, I mean, should there be like a, should there be, uh, thank you for this, it's some interesting ideas and should people before they kind of go public and, and personal and like, you know, um, online, should they be going for some kind of like an online, I don't know, AI moderated reality is like, no, actually, you're good. Should there be some kind of vetting system? I don't know, I'm just thinking. I mean, uh, yeah. Which is your specialism, I find. Yeah. I mean, I I find that AI generative, generated content or generative content quite it's quite mediocre. It's middle of the road. It's what's expected normally. Like when you get the this. I mean, we talk to a lot of academics up and down the land, and they say that the AI cheat essays that get written are like a middle-of-the-road essay. It's not saying, AI is not good at saying extreme things, it's better at saying something very middle-of-the-road and very average. So it's humans who, just, who mess it up for AI, basically? Yeah. Yeah. No, it depends on the training set. It's all, I mean, it's mostly mediocre because it's got the vast range of the web, so it, it sort of winnows it down to sort of the average or median statement or you know of whatever it is but if you'd said okay we're just going to feed you all this nonsense then it will definitely go for the higher more extreme stuff oh he's got <laughs> that's lubrication, yeah, lubrication. Yeah. I mean, that's how it all that's how it all started i mean we're talking about social lubrication uh is it achieved through uh just just communal painting of small figurines i really love that i think it's a very powerful image is it better done over a glass of drink yeah. well i mean we you know we need to get the ai drunk to to get it a bit more social a bit more pro social uh, yeah, so yeah, it's more on the kind of psychotropics when it maybe it should be on the something a bit more like the equivalent of alcohol to be a bit more of that social glue that I think it could possibly be. I mean, you mentioned about uh, halluc hallucination. Yeah, I mean, have you ever spoken to a hallucinating AI? 
I haven't personally, but I think it's a big topic that people talk about and people don't really know why that happens. But I, I do think that the nature of um, how AI is trained and continues to, to learn is, you know, it improves exponentially. So eventually there will be less and less hallucinations. Um, content may be really bad right now, generated by Gen AI, but it's going to continue to learn and improve and be almost indistinguishable from human content. So, so you're saying that the kind of... Uh, the things are developing in a way to eradicate the hallucination as some kind of like a freak element, unhelpful, not very useful part of AIs. Um, halluc hallucinating, I can't even say that tonight. I don't know what happened to me. Maybe I need to be replaced by AI. But halluc hallucinating AI, good? Not so good. I'm going to simplify. Uh, I think it, it, it depends. I think in, in uh, hallucinating AI is something that we don't control, but the thing is, generative AI, we don't control at all anyway, right? Because nobody really knows how it works. Uh, nobody really knows what happens in the black box. It's too complicated. Um, and if we look at hallucinating AI, of course, there's some really freaky stuff coming out of there. But one of the things that might be actually positive about hallucinating AI is that it at least is not average. It's something that we don't know. It might be actually closest to what we think is creativity, um, which I don't say, I don't give it a moral yes or no, but it's something that... It's a bit more exciting. Yeah. So it is a bit more exciting. It's a little bit more uh, moderate, average, etc. It's, it's something that we don't expect. And this is also what we kind of define creativity more or less. Like, you know, it's something, uh, a, a weird kind of uh, process, brain, <laughs> brain process. Um, and so there's a danger there, but there might also be an opportunity. Okay, thank you, Kitty. Uh, you guys are bouncing, but before you roll out, uh, I mean, is hallucinating um, AI as a kind of, kind of like a creative human, is, is that selling it a bit more to you, Michelle? <laughs> Potentially, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's you know definitely uh, more fun than um, you know just getting the result you expect. So that could add a creative element to things, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay. So a bit of creativity is not a bad thing after all. Uh, thank you. Is this your final thoughts, or you have any other maybe questions for the table? We're going to be here for two days. We're going to need some subjects. Uh, so you know, yeah. not for me. I'm, I'm sure Chalen has some. Okay, Chalen, uh, over to you. <laughs> Sort it out. Wow, wow. <laughs> really set me up. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I can try. Uh, okay, well, if I'm uh, if I'm going on um, techno optimism, then like it, because that's just my my theme for the the evening. Uh, I, I would ask us to uh, consider, you know, um, I think we're at MozFest to dream of like a beautiful future for how AI can actually serve us. Um, I agree that we're not there right now. I think there are a lot of dangers. I think there's a dystopian direction we can go in. I don't think we're at a point of no return. Um, I think we can... Uh, Think about, so in the uh, 60s, there was a poet, uh, Richard Brodigan in San Francisco, one of the beats. He wrote a poem um, called uh, Machines of Love and Grace. Uh, and it's about, you know, what if we could all live in a cybernetic meadow, like in harmony with animals and plants and like watched over by like machines. And it's like... Nowadays, when we think about this poem, because um, I've talked about it with some folks, I, I like it a lot. It's like very, like, is this ironic? Mm. You know, like, is this like a dystopia? Like, is it, yeah. But then, uh, but I honestly believe that like it was the '60s and things like it. It was San Francisco. I mean, we were just inventing like the first chips. You know, yeah. It was. Uh, I, I feel like at this point, yeah, he was definitely hallucinating. I mean, he was hanging out with uh, Jack Kerouac, and uh, anyway. Um, so in the 60s yet, <laughs> to be quite honest. wasn't invited. It was invented in 72 anyway. Okay, so yeah. But just to say, like, do, does any of that optimism still exist? Like, I mean, we have a, a lot of people here who are working on very interesting projects. Like, is there a, uh, a future where AI is serving us um, and where we are, uh, as Brodigan says, like, freed of our labors? Um, 
So this is this is a question I think worth considering. Okay. So can we be living in that world in a non-ironic way uh, where we are being watched over by machines of love and grace? Loving, loving grace. Loving, loving grace. grace. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, we will, we've got the button for that. That's for sure. Uh, but can we? This is a big question. But thank you so much. I hope that we can develop these thoughts. Um, so we'll be here for the next two days. But thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, you had some uh, things to say. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I think it's kind of really quickly on the hallucinating AI. I think I think it's the the, the fun part that it's a tool of control, losing control about on what it's doing, and so that's kind of fun and ironic and that's i think the pleasant part about it I mean, but like I, be ironic? I'm no, no, no it's ironic for for us i mean uh, i think but uh but i i was thinking about something you said yeah i think also uh, about the techno pessimism or optimism there can be uh we were talking about how uh, media and uh, social media engage with uh, with uh, activating content uh, being fucking afraid of ai is being fucking activated. It drives sales to, it drives engagement to make people afraid of AI. So maybe, because uh, if we see what good stuff come, uh, if we filter out what good stuff come, we can only, only see the bad stuff. Of course, there are risks. And, and a really problems if it's not uh, managed, but like it's also a tool that does good. But it's a tool again, uh, even if it's not a neutral tool. Yeah. So should we? Something like that. Yeah, so, yeah something like that for sure. I mean, sh uh, <laughs> should we be? So should we be? Um, I don't know. Just like steering away from being afraid of AI because that is just like creating a, a world and a culture of being afraid, which is good for business. Fear is good for business. I'll come to you in a second, Mikey. Kit, you you're nodding. I'll come to you in a second, Richard. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, the the web companies are really good at selling us this existential threat aspect of AI. Oh my gosh, AGI, which is the is general real? intelligence. Well, it could. The point is, it could be real, but it's probably twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years down the road. It's not now, even if. Even if. But they want to point us to that as if that's the thing to worry about. Meanwhile, it's the human beings behind the AIs today who are driving the engagement, who are driving the development, who are doing all the things they're doing to serve human interests. The AIs themselves at this point have no intentionality about them, right? It's all about the human beings. So my worry is that we're all going to look at the horizon because that's where they want us to look I'm while... Just looking, just like you yes, it's right there. See that, that white building? That's going to be where it's going to happen. That's, yeah. that's ground zero for, yeah, that's the first AGI is going to happen there. But in the meantime, it's going to be infiltrating through us and our society, and we're not going to have the wherewithal to stop it in ways that we think are will try to maintain our humanity. Uh -huh. so, okay, so don't word. look at the horizon, maintain your humanity not right not now. Not exclusively, yeah. there's things that happen right now. So look at the horizon, but also <laughs> around it. Uh, Kitty, are you looking at the horizon, or you're living in a moment, changing things as you go along? I, I think it's 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 good to look at the horizon. Uh, and funny enough, the the building that you were pointing at is the judicial building here in Amsterdam. So. <laughs> Just saying, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> this is kind of funny. <laughs> but future AI court. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, I think I think I think there's a lot of uh, things that we need to be very careful about uh, especially in indeed these things of you know pointing at way out is interesting to just avoid discussions about the things that we that you know AI is doing now um, the other thing maybe I would love to bring in is the fact that we feel uh, that a lot of the discussion is about how we feel overwhelmed and kind of, you know, powerless about uh, everybody jumping on a train. And you need to jump on the train because otherwise you're, you know, you're um, uh, holding back innovation and blah, blah, blah. And nobody talks about where the train actually is going, but uh, we need to all jump on the train. And I'm just wondering if it is not time, and I, I'm, again, I'm not really sure how to do that, but it's not time to take back control in the sense that maybe we should figure out what we actually want with society and then see how we can use a technology. Obviously, that's a utopian idea. 
I'm totally aware of that. <laughs> but I think I think in the end we might need to go to that kind of because we're not powerless, right? Because all these AI companies, these social media companies, etc., are dependent on the users, how much we are using their platforms. And of course they made us addicted addicted, so yeah, it's difficult to to quit. But it's Indeed, indeed. So it is, uh, there is an opportunity. We still have a power as a people <laughs> to talk in revolutionary terms. But yeah, I think, I think there's still. <laughs> true, 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 true. It, it is, it is with some hesitance, but there is, uh, there is a, uh, a relationship that we might be able to, uh, you know, empower ourselves mm -hmm. in. Okay, so uh, are we as disempowered as the technology as they tell us, whoever, whoever they are? And also, are, by looking at the horizon and the kind of like looming doom, are we actually using as a strategy, uh, alliteration unintended, but it kind of worked, um, are, are we just avoiding talking about the real problems right now and what are they? Are we just kind of too, you know, um, uh, focus on the, you know, the the, the apocalypse um, over there where this building is, um, and maybe further uh, beyond. Uh, and you said something uh, off mic about consent, well, manufactured, manufactured con consent. Yeah, what does that mean? And also, is it time to maybe manufacture some consent for somebody to swap with me in the middle? That could also <laughs> be a conversation. <laughs> could manufacture that. It's kind of now or never. Um, so yeah, I, I could I could do what some is little. Is your, uh, Train. Ten, ages, ages. Ten twenty-five. <laughs> ten twenty-five. Yeah. Okay. No, nine. No, no. Ten. No, you, you you reserved it from London, so oh, you shit. had you. It was a. Uh, yeah. Okay, so he should stay in the night here. No, no, it's really, I'm, I'm good. It's, yeah. It's ten, okay. Ten twenty-five. Perfect. Now. Yeah. But I mean, uh, so I mean, we can switch. But in the meantime, I'm just going to do a quick recap. I mean, so yeah, so we've got the kind of uh, the looming doom of the, you know, the horizon of where, you know, is AI putting us on a, a train in some kind of unknown direction? Are we peer pressured into going somewhere with the, with progress, whatever that is, wherever that is? We have been talking about um, social media. We've been talking about. Um, uh, techno optimism versus techno pessimism, things which are good for business, uh, AI helping the right wing people to articulate their points better, <laughs> uh, for instance, uh, and some and some other stuff. Uh, Hish, do you want to take over? Can take a break, a break, so we can. No, no, no. We're not taking a break. We just keep going. So, can somebody feel time? Um, Richard, fill time. Yeah. Well, I also have another social engagement to get to here at some point, but um. It doesn't get more social than here, though. You know that. Hey, this sounds like a. Uh, hey, here we are, Johnny Carson show. Hey, come on in. Oh, this is not on. Um. Yeah, I, I was wondering if it was on. <laughs> um. Okay, well, I'll bring us back. I'll bring us back to Wally. Yeah, go for it. Because Wally did not involve a super intelligence that was trying to control human beings. There was a evil corporation behind the scenes, uh, Axiom. Ironically, yeah, but it's funny because Axiom was the name of the company, which is also the name of one of the largest data broker companies in the world. So they like take all our personal data and sell it off to the highest bidder. Coincidence? So I think not. I think not. Whoever <laughs> came up with that name, it was, it was brilliant. But the point is, the spaceship was run by humans and programmed by humans, and the corporation, everything was about their intention. And so the AIs in that context were very much obeying whatever the humans were telling them to do. And, and you know, so like, oh, you got to stop Wally because they want to turn the spaceship around because they found life back on Earth, and Earth's a, you know, a dying moat because of what they did to it. Anyway, long story is like, most, most dystopias are around things like the Matrix or... You know, the Terminator, which is like the AI takes the intelligence and takes over, that's super easy to understand and it's super easy to get fearful about. And that's what the companies, I think, keep preying on. I keep I go back to Wally. It's more about the humans behind the scenes programming the computers to do things that turn us into subservient. In their case, subservient people wallowing around with their enormous drink jars, watching the two twenty-four by 7 and getting enormously rotund. Um, so that's the future I think we should be much more concerned about trying to stop.
Thank you, Richard. And I, I, you were asking me right before when, when you were uh, opinionless, n even maybe not even a real human being. I don't know. I, I wouldn't question that. But like you know, you asked you asked me about uh, uh, manufactured consent. What what does it mean for you? Yeah. Oh yeah, very good because obviously you've got no um, views or opinions uh, 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 in the middle. Less human. I mean, I, I don't really know what that means, but you know, but I, I, I just want to, uh, to answer the question. I don't know what this means, but what you're saying make, makes me think. I haven't read the book, but it's something that Yanis Varoufakis is talking about. A techno, no, te techno feudalism. I want to talk about before you uh, <laughs> explain to me what I'm thinking. But like, is is that something to do with? I mean, I, I just wondered whether people knew about it because I think something about uh, people becoming subservient to technology as a new form of feudalism, which kind of existed in the past uh, and was very much kind of like land related and that kind of stuff. But that's 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 pre that predates AI. That's just humans doing it to other humans. Yeah. No, but that's that's great because it's a great book because it does really go back to the past where they had the commons and you had the serfs on the commons, the peasants who didn't have a great life, but at least they were attached to the commons and they did things. And then the industrial revolution came along. Okay, we're gonna take you off the commons. We're gonna turn you into workers. Come work in the factories. Blah blah blah. And now his thesis, which is fascinating, which is now we're going back to the days of feudalism. Now you don't own anything. Everything you have, you rent, you lease. It's an experience. It's not something you put in your shelf anymore. Um, I mean, that, that's anyway. He has lots of different examples, analogies, but it's a really interesting book because it's, it's not basically saying this is not capitalism anymore. We're not about willing buyers and sellers and free markets. Adam Smith had nothing to do with this stuff. It's all about going back to the using the feudalism model, but now you just layer a bunch of technology on top of it and turn us all into serfs operating on their land that they now control. Thank you. Uh, I, I, have, I, 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 I do have a. Oh, sorry. Um, techno feudalism, what killed capitalism? It's the economist. What's his name? His last name is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yanis Vanoufakis? Okay. Yeah, he was. He was so, and I, I do have a question. Maybe I could go, go uh, around the table, or uh, um, uh, so. Appa apparently, yeah, yeah. Apparently, we're apparently we're uh, we're we're we're, uh, we're contemplating uh, techno feudalism. But what would be your way? What is your way in your life to ex escape uh, techno feudalism? Your way, and what you would identify in your life, something that you do that you gets you out of that. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll I'll go over to Kitty. Which oh maybe I go to Margo, so I we leave some time for Kitty to to think about it. I mean, it should um, be very banal or mundane. Yeah. I don't know, or it's exceptional. I don't know. No, so, so, so. I mean. Doesn't have to be I don't know. I mean, I try not to be on social media too much. That's number one. And secondly, I'm trying not to. I, I mean, I'm not trying to. I think. And naturally, I'm not driven by money and profit uh, as much. And I think, you know, for me, technology and profit making is somehow really kind of interlinked. But my natural inclination is to kind of not not take part in that because feudalism essentially for me is about exploitation to gain something. Now I don't want to be exploited, so I try to step out of that vicious cycle as much as possible uh, with mixed results. I, I I'm talking in abstract, no, but no, I it's think it's okay. I, I see mixed reaction of, about the table. You're you're hitting the table uh, uh, so much you uh, that you will to talk too much that you hit the table, uh, no, Mikey. I mean. Uh, we go around the length and breadth of most of the UK talking to people, and you can talk to anyone these days, and generally there's at some point in the conversation will go, well, there's capitalism, that's the world we live in. Not in a way where people necessarily, or they never actually see any alternative to capitalism, apart from occasionally communism, but it's very unpopular these days. But, um, yeah, but at the same time, the idea that pe everyone tends to understand that we're kind of trapped in this capitalist world that we don't want to live in. So that that kind of knowledge and that understanding is very widespread, much more from when I first started doing Tokyoki 25 years ago. And, you know, you can go to a youth club in Burnley and people will go, that's capitalism. Yeah. You know, so people... 
everywhere understand they're kind of trapped by capitalism. Maybe just at the moment where it's no longer going to be capitalism, but techno feudalism. But I do, I do think there is this kind of understanding about where we are and the the disadvantages of that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I yeah, Richard, you had something to. No, I'm just no. I, oh. <laughs> um, all right, but I think. That's the point of the book, which is to say we don't live in capitalism anymore. Capitalism is about willing buyers and sellers. But the web in the last 20 years, roughly, has manufactured consent, right? And GDPR, for example, which is, you know, the data protection law here, in, well, in Europe, you guys aren't here. Right? Yeah, you're here. That's right. Not in the UK. Um, but, you know, not for now. Yeah. I think you're coming back in three to five years. But anyway, the, the GDPR was about, okay, let's have notice of consent. Well. Everybody gets all the pop-ups every time you go to any website or any app. Nobody reads anything because all you want to do is go to get your free cat videos. So consent doesn't mean anything on the web anymore. It just doesn't exist. It's not meaningful. And because of that, what would it be a willing buyer and seller? I walk in your shop, I talk to you, I want to, hey, I want to buy that. Let's, let's bargain over it or I'll take your price or whatever. That doesn't happen. They just come and take your data. And you basically have no recourse because it's just so complex, it's so overwhelming, and I don't have the time to deal with it. So that's, I think, what gets into the, the thesis, which is that we're not actually dealing with traditional capitalism or traditional markets. We're dealing with this completely one-sided platform that they control all the levers, all the interfaces, and we just more or less do what, what the signals tell us to do. Pretty bleak, you say. So, so that, but, but like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, Kitty. So, so I agree. We, I don't think we live in a in in capitalism. I, I think we don't live in a system of capitalism for a long, long time. There are too many regulations and limitations on trade, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to even call it capitalism. So it's it's very protective in that sense. I'm not. I'm. By the way, I'm not. I'm not advocating for <laughs> pure capitalism. I'm not sure if that's per, per se better, but I don't think we live in that. I think I think what we're living in right now is consumerism, uh, an era of consumerism, which is very much focused on us buying stuff. And um, I think that is uh, that is encouraged by algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but I think as long as we are not willing to let go of that kind of lifestyle, in the sense of that you know we can just this, this whole idea that we can just buy anything, comfort, health, uh, good looks, uh, reputation, anything that um, we are not going to get out of this sort of pickle or out of this sort of control that these tech companies have over us because this is exactly what they are focusing on and what they are how they are luring us into their uh, nests so I think it's not so much capitalism again I think it's much more consumerism which I think is slightly different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you had something to say yeah I don't think it's I mean I you know I don't I think it's it's not classic capitalism, but I think it's still very much, you know, everyone's talking about the markets and like the, you know, earlier on we were talking about how social media platforms are driven by business interests. So it's still, I think, you know, it's all, it is about owning assets, just the assets are, are different. And, uh, you know, but yeah, we are the assets, exactly, and we get owned, but it's still about buying and selling assets um, and you know I think a few years ago everyone's talking about oh, but we're all post Fordian now meaning we're you know we're our work kind of ethos is no longer about this production line this Fordian factory production line but I just think that's not true because uh, the factories have just got bigger and they're all in China so it's a global Fordianism rather than a national Fordianism but I, I, I personally would disagree and I think that capitalism is kind of going full swing stronger than ever it's just there are more assets out there because we've been turned into assets as well well, uh, in uh, what way uh, do you think? Uh, okay, Margot, you have something to say, but maybe uh, I ask a question. Like, in, in what way do you feel in your life? Do you have you ever felt that you were being an asset at, at some moment? Maybe we can see for that if someone doesn't have another topic. 
No, but I was going to say something uh, along similar lines. I think maybe one of the ways in which I rebel against being in this techno feudalism or capitalism is to kind of uh, try to remove myself from being like I, I understand that I could be an asset in some ways, but I'm just not playing ball. Uh, and maybe I, it's just the Catholic part of me is like, oh, I, I'm just so poor that I'm just going to make into a virtue. Here's <laughs> yeah. the other cheek, just go for it. Um, you know, maybe it's partly that, so it's even more complicated and twisted. But I think, yeah, just kind of understanding the value of yourself as an asset, which is just such a fucked up thing, uh, and then just say like, no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not going to join your factory or something like that. You have, you have some th yeah, there's a, a really excellent book. I think it's five, six years ago now by Helen Nissenbaum called Obfuscation. And it basically like these various tactics she and her co-author propose, and there's like 30 or 40 of them, to basically, as she thinks of it, throwing sand in the gears of the, the techno-feudalists, right? So like never signing in with your real name, always giving fake email. I mean, she has like this long list of things. They're basically intended to confuse and mess up the algorithm and make it harder for them to crab onto you and figure out what they're doing. As she said in the book, you know, they, they glom onto it. As soon as you start talking about it, they start to figure out how to try to get ahead of you. So it's just a classic arms race. You've got to keep finding out new ways of trying to gum up the works um, on, on their end of it. But I found that really interesting and, and sort of comforting that, that you should take that almost, you know, you're the small army against the big army. You just got to be more, you got to be more thoughtful and strategic and tactical and all of that. Guerrilla and so a uh, guerrilla tactics, mm -hmm. basically, as they say, that's what the, yeah, what's the guerrilla? It's what the big army calls the small army. Mm -hmm. um, so some maybe taking things into our own hands to some degree, it's not going to fix the whole system by any means, but it may help if everybody gets on board, then you've really got a sort of a revolution going. So I, I feel like at our small scale, uh, I'll let you speak, of course. But I feel like we we are trying to to congregate those uh, knowledge about uh, about uh, fighting I, I, it off. I don't know. I just feel like this idea at, at the moment, anyway, is so niche. I think it's even more niche than painting miniature figures. <laughs> Oh, it's yeah. not that niche. It is really niche because, like, I mean, I was doing a talkie yesterday out in a youth club in Stratford, and we were talking to some elections, and people, the young people in London right now are very turned off by politics. They hate politics, but they're really into issues. However, they don't connect the two. But all of their information about issues, about politics, everything came from one source and that well not one source but one platform and that was TikTok and the, um, and they're not having conversations about oh, are they harvesting our data they're like oh have you seen this one you know and but some of it was useful information about politics about the the our current prime minister about other politicians about their policies it's all coming through TikTok even they're using TikTok as a search engine if they want to find out how to do something they search TikTok not Google which is it better is TikTok better than Google? Is Google better than TikTok <laughs> even? I would reformulate. Um, I, uh, I, I read somewhere, no, I was listening to a podcast or something like that, and they were saying it's like, um, it's like an alternative media platform in Poland, uh, where I'm from, uh, and they were saying that they're trying to get to new audience or younger audiences by producing content that's just going to, like, um, you know, uh, we, we just get through the algorithm so for instance they'll do somebody will be doing like a commentary on some kind of political situation or uh, whilst doing makeup and I think MozFest did it as well. Like they were, they were having somebody talking about whatever it was, some kind of a, a data-related issue. But she was doing makeup really badly, and she's like, "Yeah, watch, watch me more for more political content, but not for makeup tips, because I'm really bad at that." And I thought it's just such a great way of, uh, you know, kind of subverting the algorithm and just being creative with it. But I, I think it's true. We have to come up with new strategies to, you know, creative strategies. Um, yeah. In Hong Kong, I've, I've heard like in the past couple of years that try to deliver political messages, but do it in a way it's over a medium, like a video, a dance video, a song or whatever. Now there's even a song that they've banned because it was something they were using to, you know, to highlight their opposition to the government. So the government is like telling YouTube to stop carrying this song. Like, or people singing the song, even though it has nothing to do with anything. It's just a, basically a song, but it's intended to represent opposition.
You have it. Yeah. No, this reminds me. Apparently, uh, sorry to bring it to Israel, but I've just done a little bit of re uh, reading about it recently. But apparently, um, in Israel, it's quite common to kind of um, kind of hijack popular songs to carry like a religious message. So they'll take like a, I don't know, like top of the charts track, and they're just like. Carry this candle for I know there's no singing in Tokyo, but you know they'll just like replace some words, and that is just like some kind of like a madly popular way of like getting, uh, yeah, the kind of religious messaging into popular culture, and then before you know it, you can't just like these are the only lines you remember. I, I am I'm, I'm wondering yeah, like I don't know to which extent everybody is uh, religious or not, but maybe you have something to say first to that. But like uh, I was wondering uh, what's creative if goofy ways of uh, of being uh, contacted with pol uh, political or religious contact have you experienced like recently or even in your life uh, I don't know if you you, you have experiences with that uh, you saw a, a religious message or a, a weird with videos and ah oh, it's a religious thing oh wow that's weird and then uncanny I don't know if it, you had ever such kind of experience ever no, I think it's not in my algorithms, to be quite honest. <laughs> atheist, algorithms. <laughs> atheist algorithms only. Uh, and, and, and the only thing I've seen in terms of religion is, 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 is maybe the, the American kind of, you know, wealth gospel and stuff like that. And then, then I'm really grossed out. But, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's helpful in, in this question. But, I, th I just want to comment or respond on this whole idea of making content more accessible for youth and uh, adjusting it. And I think it's a huge dilemma. And, and, and on one hand, I totally agree that we need to adjust to the the uh, you know experience and, and the, the way young people experience or perceive life and 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 messages within that um, the other thing is what I find really scary and concerning is that with these kinds of uh, strategies like you know using songs and stuff like that to to convey messages political messages is that you take out the complexity that is politics and that um, messages are being smashed to sort of flat uh, narratives and I think especially when we talk about politics and especially when we talk about very complicated issues like war and conflict and uh, it is um, a, I think but maybe I'm just too old but I think it's a disservice to people to just feed them these sort of very flat one line linear messages that don't capture the actual uh, complexity of the issue so this because and the thing is that these strategies these tactics for uh, conveying these messages are um, easy to adopt both for both sides or all sides involved right and it's usually so it's 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 not like okay we can so I, I still am of the age when we had the the um, the uh, revolution in the Middle East and where we talked about how wonderful uh, social media was in uh, you know what kind of role it played etc cetera, etc cetera, and everybody was super enthusiastic and uh, super positive about how voices could be heard, could be made heard through these social medias. But it only took like a few months for the regimes to also use those social medias in exactly the same way and actually maybe even more effective against those people. So it's, I've, I've, yes, interesting, yes, we should probably look into that, but I'm also a bit concerned about that. So we, it feels like, again, we come back to the fact that uh, me, those are, are a tool and who gets to use it with the most power gets the most results. I don't know. I, I there, was a, uh, there was a moment in the mid-90s, some of us were around then, um, <laughs> when there was a techno-optimism, that the internet was inherently a platform of freedom. Uh, uh, information wants to be free, right? 
you old, you old, you know, analog so and so's get the hell out of here. We're taking over now, right? And it's all going to be amazing. So it was, it was that was the sense. But then, yeah, any technology can be co-opted, and as with the Arab Spring or any other, you know, uh, any other quote revolution that's been out there over the last 20 years. You know the bad guys, quote unquote, again, sort of figure it out and get ahead of it. And now I think it's fair to say, both on the government side, but even on the corporate side, the people in charge are not necessarily doing what they do in the best interests of the of the general public. I was actually going to make exactly that point a bit earlier on because I think it's true. We were so optimistic, and I think at the peak of it was around the turn of the millennium as well. Probably, you know, we at the time. I think people, like I was very much involved in new media art in London and all these kind of techie people, they thought that the problem with the world was that people were not getting the information. And I think, you know, all they needed was access to the truth and that was it, you know. But it didn't come, it didn't work out like that. That wasn't actually, maybe it wasn't actually the problem, I don't know, or maybe they still don't have access to the truth. Um, I think it's probably that isn't the problem. Um, but we thought in the 90s it was that, oh, mass media controls the ideas, controls the narrative. It, I think we were actually wrong about that. Um, and we've been proved wrong. It's not just that bad people took, took over. I think it's we kind of just, our assessment of what we thought politically was wrong in the 90s was actually wrong. It sounded as if the truth is a complex concept that they cannot be summarized. I would, I, 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 I would agree with that. And, uh, I can, I can, or chat C CCP if you're in China. Um, it's not the original uh, quote anyway. Anyway, but what I wanted to say, I think. Uh, I think there was a lot of optimism about social media and people just like, you know, um, having their own platform and stuff. But I think what had happened is like we're living in a world of, uh, you know, just like opinions and other opinions and more opinions, but which are not the same as facts, they're not the same as complexity of issues like you mentioned, war or whatever. I think it just kind of really flattens the world. Um, uh, and um, I, I was... Uh, I was um, I was reading. Um, uh, I, I don't fully understand it, but I'm trying to get my head around uh, Jürgen Habermas's idea of the public sphere, and he's talking exactly about that. We don't see eye to eye on the big subjects like what is truth, like what is the the real, you know, what are the real values here. Um, we instead just like forever like bounce around these opinions, which is, is really counterproductive to democracy. Democracy isn't de deliberative in the way that it could be. Uh, more, we don't make decisions based on real kind of knowledge and, and real dialogue. We base it on uh, on opinions. And the final thing I'm going to say is like you get a lot of people on social media taking some kind of a concept of like, oh, yeah, let me tell you about psych psychology or this concept of narcissism or whatever, whatever. And they just speak with so much enthusiasm, but they haven't probably read all the kind of, you know, research about it, but they've got enough pizzazz and energy to kind of sell it and people go, oh yeah, narcissism, I know all about it. And that really flattens the complexity of knowledge and yeah, I'll, the truth. I'll, I'll turn the mic over to Mike again. But uh, just, uh, what is the place in that, uh, that thing for vulgar vulgarization, for example, which are people who take a com complex uh, subject and summarize it to be understandable or reachable for people who are have are not scholars, for example, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, you know, I think the issue is we don't have a mutually agreed protocol about w how we define a, a fact or what is the difference between freedom of speech and hateful speech or when somebody should be listened to and when they shouldn't be listened to. We, we, All of these things, people like up in arms and talking about it, but what we don't have is a very mutually agreed protocol of how this actually works. And I think that to me is the problem. Um, uh, can there be a mutual agreed uh, agreement on what is a fact or what is not and how to reach the these facts? Yeah, I, th I think in the States, one of the ironies for me was that back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the conservatives would 
would sort of really ridicule the left, quote unquote, because of things like, oh, it's about subjectivity, relativity, you know, you all are more about like sort of feeling things, not thinking things, rationality is poo-pooed, it's all about the Western blah, 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 and they, so they, they, would, they would take on a lot of, you know, sort of elements of the left. Now, fast forward to where we are today, we have what Stephen Colbert would call truthiness, right? Truth is what I feel to be truth, and it's mostly on the right. They're the ones who are trashing the notions of objective empirical standards around things, right? And, and I mean, that's, at least in the political discourse, that's, that's problematic, right? I mean, like, oh, that election was fraudulent. Really? Well, the facts show it wasn't. No, no, I feel it was. It was fraudulent. It was ripped, you know. They, that, that becomes the, the part of the discourse. So if, if, if the sides can't agree on what the actual standard is to whether or not something is an objective truth, then we're, we're in a pretty bad spot because, you know, then where do we find any kind of, even compromise is now a bad word, at least in the States, again, but it's like you can't even find an accommodation to know where you start to have an honest dialogue around something. I feel like Kitty had uh, something to say about that. You you were you shrugged a bit. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, I think to be quite honest, I think both sides are doing this, uh, just uh, ig ignoring or or disavowing the you know the, the truth of the other. Uh, what I find really difficult these days is not so much that maybe I think in the in the end everybody wants to have a good society. We're just we just we don't agree on how to get there, obviously. But this there is a sort of common value there. I think uh, if you if you take it really meta, uh, the only thing is I think that we've lost the ability to respectfully discuss these things. Uh, everything becomes immediately very personal. So if I don't agree with you, I am insulting you personally because I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, I think social media had a role to play in this kind of mentality because it's, you know, uh, uh, fights are more attractive in social media to follow, unfortunately, um, than, uh, than agreement. Um, and I think we've kind of nurtured this sort of men new mentality of not taking pride in listening to each other, in discussing things, in having a respectful debate, um, being open to things. Uh, and I think this is maybe one of the major issues that we have today is that that everything that we that doesn't fit in our narrative is an an personal assault, uh, and I think if we would be able to get around that again to actually listen and funny enough, if you put people together in a room physically who do not agree and have them talk about these things, then suddenly it appears that people can listen to each other and are able to do that, especially if it's moderated. But if you have these discussions on an anonymous platform and you don't see each other, you don't, you don't see or uh, perceive the person in front of you anymore as a person, as a human, then uh, it's very easy also to, to just disrespect or disregard uh, the ideas of another. So I, th I think there is maybe part of the solution. But um, about people in the room, my f my friend Very did well. uh, did a course in uh, what was called a cl um, cl dealing with cl climate grief or something like this, really something profound. So she booked on this course, but it was called something. That's what it was called before, and then this guy from Germany booked on it, and then before the course started or this workshop, they changed the um, the title to oh, managing climate something, anxiety or something. And this dude comes and is like, no, I came here to deal with grief. I want like hardcore stuff. That's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about anxiety. That's just superficial. Anyway, but they had groups of people in the room and they were very, very diverse groups of people from different countries, different parts of the world, different ethnicities, ages and backgrounds. Um, and then when they were talking, and uh, it, it was a facilitated space, but when they were talking about climate, um, there was a group of people who were just like, we're just so fed up with this, like white, European, 
Eurocentric agenda. We're just, we're just going to form our own circle. We're just going to mo self-moderate our own thing. And suddenly I was like, what? You know, because it was people in the room, but discussing something so profound and so deep, and people were like crying. They were really, you know, emotionally involved in it. They weren't able. It was hard to get people to actually discuss something so profound in a room. So I think in general, yes, we can work stuff out in a room face to face, but maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it, was, it, it just really struck me that it was. Is there a difference between being listened to and being heard? Which is. No, plus that, yeah. For example, I don't know what they use. Question that. Um, no, these are very deep questions. Um, <laughs> I'll bring it back a bit to tech because there's a company I know in Silicon Valley that's working on an AI that's intended to be like sort of the supreme mediator or moderator or whatever you want to call it. No modesty. That, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the founders are all, uh, you know, geniuses and all that if, and, and if you listen to them. But they seem, whether or not there's reality to it, they seem very bought into this notion that we have to learn as a society to talk to each other. And if we can't find humans to do it, let's find an AI that's trained to understand human psychology and understand how to get people to talk to each other. So, it, and and apparently has had some success. Like, come, they've come in and like done things with unions and you know labor disputes kinds of things, um, employment law issues, um, some political stuff too. With again, with some success. So, I, I I don't know whether that actually works, but to me, it's an example of if it's if it does work, that is an example maybe where AI can sort of bridge the gap between humans that otherwise we're just having a really difficult time doing it on our own. So maybe that's one use case for tech that, that maybe is a, is a plus. It would take over, it would take to, to divorce the mediation from the bias of human beings to get over the bias of the humans. Yeah, but apparently like, like that. questions, mm. even triggering questions, it brings things up. But it, no, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it, it brings <laughs> things up. It, it, it talks, it talks like it, no, it has an understanding and appreciation. Again, this is all based on what they said, of like both sides and tries to pull people in from where they are, not trying to talk down to them, not try to get them to switch sides, but bring them in on their own terms and then start to find little commonalities and, and sort of stitch something together. That's at least the, as I understood it. Yeah. I'd be interested in that approach, but also I'd be interested in, I mean, <laughs> uh, how do you kind of, uh, can AI make risky jokes? Because I think one of the things about making risky jokes, as Slavoj Žižek says, like this is a real kind of glimpse into uh, a, a nations or cultures, taboos and really big subjects, if you can really just put something out there, which is maybe a bit crass, a bit vulgar, a bit, um, I don't know, controversial, but maybe you're cutting into something that cannot be, you know, described or explained in this kind of, I, I call it this kind of psychologizing language. It's like, yeah, I really hear what you're saying. I find that personally infuriating. I see the value in it, but the minute somebody talks to me like that, I just want to punch them. Maybe I've got an issue. Maybe I do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think often, a, you know, if you're in a tense situation, the joke, it's a risk, as you say, and this is the one of the things I think I'm really interested in humour and how it works and I think it can be really powerful but of sometimes it can go wrong if you get the joke wrong as well so it's kind of, and I think AI is particularly bad at humour as well because it's of such a complex skill um, so yeah uh, I, I do think you're, you're on something there with the, with the gags we definitely like to have some gags don't we in the Tokyo King yeah is AI bad in human uh, human humor, or is it good at AI humor? I mean, is there some kind of like a new branch of humor? I, I just wonder. I mean, will we be laughing at things that AI creates as a funny content in the future? I don't know. What What would you describe as AI humor op opposed to human humor? <laughs> Two robots <laughs> I'm sure I come up with a robot joke. I can't come up with. I've not got one on the top of my head, but you know, uh, what what's that perfume you're wearing? WD-40. It's the second time I've mentioned WD-40. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's really stupid. But uh, no, I think I'm. But it's, yeah. 
that. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is, is like, I do think humour has actually changed because of social media, but it's become much more visual. The idea of telling a joke and like little jokes people used to tell each other, they don't tell it, they send each other memes now mm. instead of like, oh, you know, in the back in the 80s and 90s, we always used to have an Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman. You probably had like a French, a Belgian, and a Dutch or something like that. Uh, yeah, the bells at the end. So, but this kind of jokes have literally died out. You don't have these jokes that just circulate among people anymore. So the humour has definitely changed. So, po possibly with AI, it would change again. In, uh, in what sense do you feel these kind of jokes? I don't know if you keep hearing them uh, regularly, but maybe do you have any opinions on how come they're not heard that much? Aside from the potential uh, bigotry, <laughs> I think there's some of that. I think I think there's some concern, sensitivity, right around you know. Oh, I mean, back in the day in the U.S. and no offense at all, I was like, oh, a, a Polish person walked in or whatever, right? I mean, yeah. no, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but I, that, I. So I think there's there's. I think it makes a lot of sense that you. That's that's offensive, right? But then when you take away the sort of the stereotypes that behind a lot of jokes, behind different things, what's left, <laughs> right? You want to laugh at ourselves, laugh at each other in a good-humored way, but but if you if, if you're too careful about the sensitivity side of it, then maybe you lose lose some of the ability to, to poke fun at each other. But yeah, I wonder if uh, where is the, the the frontier between laughing at each other and dehumanizing. Humanizing people, it, maybe yeah, yeah. that's part of the answer. I don't know. Yeah, but I think I think I think the uh, maybe what I'm going to say right now is very politically in incorrect. But I think the uh, the sensitivity of that uh, that boundary has become very tight. Um, because I think humor and also having stereotypes within that humor um, was also a way to make sense of the world in a sense. Um, I'm not saying it was that makes it always right, but I sometimes feel, and you know, I'm Asian, there's a lot of jokes about Asians. Um, but I think as soon as you start to feel that it is, again, personal, it is a big issue, right? You, then you get offended. I've never really felt offended by people that make that make jokes about Asian stereotypes because I've never felt that I belonged to that stereotype that it kind of, you know, applied to me. Uh, that, and again, it's it's of course nuanced. Some people might feel that way, so I don't want to, you know, disregard their feelings about it. But it. It sometimes feels for me that um, we get offended awfully quickly these days. And uh, yeah, maybe there's uh, there's this sort of, that there's a part of the problem, but yeah. I think it's interesting, it just made me think of something, you know, it's, it's, it's a little kind of thin line between wanting to be an individual, but also being part of the the people, the nation, the whatever, something, some kind of belonging. Because I certainly, when I first moved to the UK from Poland, I was always really like annoyed when people say like, "Oh, you're Polish. Oh, our cleaner is Polish. Oh, that's so cool." I'm like, "I'm not a cleaner. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> I'm an artist." Uh, you know. And I'd always be very particular about making a point. It's like, "Yeah, but I'm not like all the Polish people." And then after a while, and then recently, my friend who will go unnamed, uh, there, were, there was I was in a in a room, and there was another person, Polish woman, who came into the room, and then. And my friend said, oh, I hope you don't mind, but you look just like one another. You look very similar. Um, and the old me would be raging, but actually I'm just so divorced from my individuality uh, now on some level that actually I don't mind that. Actually, if somebody said to me, like, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, a cleaner is Polish, I'd be like, oh, yeah, great, sounds amazing. But I think, you know, this kind of, like, need to be an individual and to be seen for who you really are. Uh, but really, we see people, if you don't know people, we just see them in broad strokes. They're just, like, blobs. Sometimes you can discern gender or, like, hair color or something like that. But in general, there's so many people in the world, you just, you know, it's easier for the brain to see them as blobs. I'm happy to be a blob. It's, it's fine. I, I'm okay with it now. And I've got therapy. <laughs> 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 so, just, I, and again, 
maybe I'm getting too old for these things, but this whole idea of wanting to be seen for who you really are, what does that even mean? I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't get it. It's like, why, if you're happy with who you are, then why would you even freaking care um, what strange people think of you? And maybe, and, but I do think that that is something that social media has created that suddenly it's because you know in the old days you have you had friends you had friends of friends and family and maybe friends of family but that was basically your your circle of influence and now the freaking whole world sees you so i i can understand if you're growing up in this day and age then this might be very um uh intimidating but you know a lot of people so i'm South Korean born. I was seven months when I came to the Netherlands. I was adopted. And I'm very happy with my parents. And a lot of people ask me, like, so, but don't you want to know what your roots are? And I would always think, do you even know what that is? Why are you asking me? You know, so, so there's a lot of things that we kind of put on other people. Uh, and this whole idea of I want to be seen for who I really am is, I, is what what does it even mean, right? So maybe I'm, but I, I always get and maybe the older I get, I get more annoyed about it. But it's it's like, can somebody please explain to me in concrete terms what that actually means? What a what? And, and by the way, do I really? What a what means? To know who you really, to s yeah, that other people see, to be seen as who you really, what does it even mean? And I don't want people to see what I really am. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's me, uh, that's, the question. that's me getting up in the morning after having too much to drink and I'm like, you know, I want people to see me as I want them to see me, right? I want to control that imagery, that's a little different than like, oh, I want to be completely, you know, <laughs> Divorce is, it, from any is it about negativity. identity or is it maybe about the dynamics between uh, people that I, because there's not maybe only identity I, I've, I've heard that for some people it's also the dumb dynamics of power that uh, gets in superimposed under the the jokes and stuff like that maybe you have a yeah I mean that's just talking about humor I really like uh, Larry David curb your enthusiasm just finished season 12 but the whole joke there is what he's really thinking he just says whatever he's thinking whatever's on his mind and even if it's awkward or if it's like embarrassing he just does it anyway and i think there's a lot of humor in that and that is seeing larry david who he really is in a way it's a kind of it's a performance of that it's not i'm sure it's not really like that as in the thing but that i think that's a starting point at least for that humor and i think it's it is very funny actually to see people who they really are and what they're really thinking and you know and when it, the, the stuff that they would normally be embarrassed about or want to hold back or be awkward about is actually quite interesting and funny in Hollywood, nobody says what they think, right? So he's like the outlier and they're all like aghast because they have all these images they've built up about themselves yeah so, so that's it. So that's actually funny that once you have someone that really wants to see the world <laughs> who they really are, that everybody is like offended, you know? Like it's so. Again, it it, it feels like something that we have uh, that that some smart advertising agency has just you know launched this idea of to be who you really are, and and everybody is just repeating it but nobody really knows what is meant by it maybe yeah it's kind of like um it's kind of like being who we really are we're just kind of consumers just like b being really susceptible to advertising just <laughs> I am what I coke in, yeah i work uh enjoy <laughs> also you know stuff like that but um but yeah, what does it mean? I mean, I, I do think that we that we live in a, in a world of you know emphasized individuality. Individuality is some kind of a product uh, uh, as well. Uh, we were recently doing Tokyo Kin, had this guy on a table, and he was, yeah, I paint, I do this, then the other, but I'm also a male model. I'm like, oh yeah, good for you. Um, and he said, you know, um, 
and we were talking about different body shapes and he said well actually being mixed heritage as you can see I'm uh, I'm uh, what, what was it Middle Eastern Middle Eastern that really sells in 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 the fashion world so I think that again just like having complex identity oh um, I'm Polish I'm uh, this I, 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 whatever I'm I'm gender non non-conforming uh, I grew up in communist times or whatever it is like everything is almost like a label and something that helps you market yourself that's if you're interested in it but as somebody who makes performance uh, and tries to apply for funding in the UK to get that performance made and funded you kind of understand like I worked out that you have to say the right things I have to emphasize them a migrant I have to emphasize them a woman I have to emphasize them working class even though in Poland is a bit more complicated but I have to make it you know have to know your target audience so it's it's, it's really weird yeah I don't know but I, I maybe if I'm, I'm asking a question here but like uh, at some point was it okay to voice uh, offend offense or about the the, the corny jokes uh, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe uh, 40 years back. Was it okay to be offended by corny jokes? As uh, maybe there's a history uh, behind the fact that people now have the right to be offended, maybe, and now they voice it. Beforehand, it was not really an option to be offended, so you had to roll with the punches, maybe. And so now it's a right; it gets expressed with the excesses. I mean, I think then as now, it's if someone's making a joke. I mean, obviously, you try to be kind in humour and try to make jokes that people, you know, punch up, not down, and all that stuff. But uh, it's um, obviously just mu you kill the flow if you really say, "Oh, you've just that's you're being ho you're being nasty, you're being horrible." So it's much easier to to just roll with it. And I think s probably uh, if that does happen and someone says some a bad joke. I try to just make a better joke, which kind of criticizes their joke, but that's also quite a hard thing to do. No one said it was easy. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So I have, uh, yeah. Uh, can I have maybe to think about the fact that I have mm. to take a train? After yes. So, uh, oh, well, I think we've reached the end yeah. of the line of this conversation as yeah. well. We've reached the terminus, yeah, but and we're ready to get off. With, uh, uh, with, uh, yeah. with people who made it to the end of the line, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very, uh, very proud of you. So you're, you're so resilient, yes. and uh, or maybe we are as a group oh, very oh, interesting. Oh, maybe oh, that's oh, it. Overly no, overly optimistic. I'm, maybe I'm being very optimistic about the fact that we're very interesting. Maybe I'm. That's the the yeah. point where I'm the most optimistic about. Yes. Maybe overly so. So yeah, we'll do some final thoughts, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Maybe uh, yeah. Uh, we'll start over with uh, with Kitty, if you will. Do so you have um, final thoughts before we, we no close up shop for the day and you, we let you go on your merry way? I think Mike, I think Mike, has, Mike has one, yeah, yeah. Is it a joke, Mike? A, a Pole, a Belgian, a Dutch, an American and a British <laughs> walk into a bar. Yeah? Three hours later, they're still trying to finish off the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, th I think that's, uh, yeah. yeah. You can go the applause. Mike, Mike, it's no. a circular conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I don't f no, the applause, the applause. Oh, this conversation reached so It's a good one, it was a good one. I, I, I liked it. It was remotely a joke maybe, but it was good though. Uh, uh, final thoughts, Margo? Humor, humor, humor. Thanks. Humor us about your thoughts about humor. Um, Richard, so we, we leave Kitty a little bit more time for her closing thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so whenever I get flabbergasted, I tend to rely on Elvis Costello, one of my patron saints. And one of his songs says, I used to be disgusted, now I try to be amused. So, well, uh, food for thought. Food for thought. Uh, disgusting for, for thought or, or amusing? Uh, f food for th discuss, f food for thought. Um, Kitty, uh, you can also opt not to have any last thought and leave us because uh, it's okay. Yeah, with s silence can be golden too. There's two more if you days, want. right? Yeah. yeah, you have two more days. Yeah. Ah, oh, she found. Uh, yeah, she uh, found something. ChatGPT. I, fi I found a quote this from this afternoon. So. This is from Kurt Vonnegut. We'll go down in history as the first society that wouldn't save itself because it wasn't cost effective. Mm 
Oh, ominous, ominous. Um, was it uh, was it amused? Uh, was it food for thought? It certainly is food for thought. Maybe a bit hard to digest, a bit a bit heavy on the stomach. Yeah, but it was free. But we didn't get it though. Though <laughs> we were stuck here <laughs> all afternoon, so we didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, internet. Whoever you are, whenever it is that you are watching this, we bid you farewell. We bid you a good life, a good jokes, uh, better than mine, anyways. So. Um, uh, uh, Bye bye. That was Tokyo Oki, the the show where you 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 decide what to talk about. Say farewell to our future AI overlords. <laughs> We salute you. Uh, be careful about the pigs. And let's have a big round of applause for Hisham in the middle for the first time ever. Promising new talent. Thank you.